Welcome back to the show. My guest today is Mike Nelson. Mike is a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army. Uh, 23 years. Is that right, Mike? That's correct. Just closing okay. out 23 years and getting ready to retire. Closing out 23 years. Uh, I'm much of that in, our, in the Special Forces and is currently the professor of military science and chair of, of the military science department at George Mason University. I had to read that off your bio to make sure I got it right. And Mike's list of accomplishments and accolades are so numerous that we would be here for a while. So I'll let him get into that while we record. But uh, Mike, thanks a lot, man, uh, for coming on the show. Thanks. Uh, I appreciate you having me here. Glad to talk. Absolutely. Um, all right. So let's start quickly from the beginning. We got into it a little bit before we started recording. Uh, you grew up in Europe, um, but uh, where were you born? And then talk us through getting into the army, uh, into the family business, as you say. Yep. So uh, I was uh, I was born. My, my, my dad was on his first duty assignment in the army. Uh, he was stationed in northwestern Germany uh, in a place called Geilenkirchen. Uh, with the 85th Field Artillery Detachment, it was a unit that was uh, pretty unique um, because of some of our, you know, nuclear non-proliferation agreements. We did not give the German, the Germans themselves, uh, the Pershing One missile originally. But what we did do is, well, we didn't give them the warheads. Uh, so we sold them the missile, and then we had a detachment of American field artillerymen with the warheads, basically sitting alongside them. And that was my dad's job. He was a Pershing missileer. Uh, in Germany. And uh, I was born uh, actually just across the border in Holland. Uh, the closest hospital where my parents lived was across the border. So uh, I, I was, I was, I joked that I was my parents' Dutch, Dutch anchor baby. Uh, I was a Dutch citizen for 17 years with dual nationality um, and lived there in Germany for three years. Uh, it was great. You know, my parents took me all over the place. I don't remember most of the traveling there, but I got to go to like 13 countries before I ever set foot in the U.S. Um, then we moved to Oklahoma, uh, where my dad was a battery commander, uh, also of a Pershing unit, Pershing missile, Pershing two this time. Um, then he took a career change. He went to become what's called a Russian foreign area officer. Mm -hmm. So we moved to Monterey for a year yep. of Russian language uh, instruction where he learned at DLI. DLI, uh, yeah. Moved to Garmisch, Germany, where there is now the Marshall Center, but it used to be the U.S. Army Russia Institute for two more years of not only language, but training on Soviet doctrine and everything that they needed to know to be a, a foreign area officer. Um, moved then here, northern Virginia, where I live now, um, for the first time uh, for about five years when my dad was at DIA. Uh, then went, he got assigned to the defense attache office at the embassy in Prague. So I got to live for three years in, in, well, I moved to Czechoslovakia and after my first six months, then Czech Republic, when they, when the two countries split, um, for, uh, for my, the last three years of my high school. So I graduated from high school there and then, uh, went to the only place I applied, the only place I wanted to go, I went to the Virginia Military Institute. Uh, I knew what I wanted to do, showed up with an Army ROTC scholarship. And, uh, I guess that, that, that was my, my, I, I joke now as I get ready to go out to find another job, a grown-up job after I leave the Army, uh, that the last time I did a job interview was 17 years old, applying for an ROTC scholarship. So. Right, for an ROTC, right. right. So I have two, two quick questions. Um, mm -hmm. We both talked about how, what a beautiful place Prague is, Czech Republic. Um, that's kind of, that time period you were there. First of all, how long was your father in his total service time? How long was that? He was in for 20 years. 20 years. Okay. Yeah. Now you go, we talked about Prague, what a beautiful place it is. If anybody hasn't been there, you should go. Um, you were there, what you were there in your mid to late teens. Yeah. So I moved there. I was just about to turn 15 when I moved there and I graduated at, at 17 and, and started school back here. Okay. And so obviously that's early nineties. You're coming out of your few years out of the, the wall falling. Um, were you kind of, obviously you're what your dad did, you were aware, but, um, mm -hmm. What were your impressions of, of Prague at that time in terms of related to the Soviets and, and the security situation and that type of thing? It was a it was a really good time to live there for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, so 92, you know, things had been decommunized or, or uh, for a while, but there were still some of the uh, I guess the, the, the cultural lingerings, uh, so to speak, um, you know, it was. It was Big news, a little bit before I moved there, they got their first McDonald's while I was there. We got the first KFC. And these things, you know, everything American and Western was still kind of new and shiny. Um, everybody, well, I won't say everybody over there was friendly. There were a lot of like old, 
in the older generation, you got this kind of, um, I don't know, this kind of a, a, a built up sense of, of, of minding your own business, I guess, that will probably uh, uh, went from living in a, in a, in a communist state. But, um, you know, it, it was also the first time we lived overseas where we weren't living on an American concern or an American German joint military concern or, or complex. Uh, so we were living out like among our Czech neighbors, uh, and it was great. Um, and it was also an incredibly safe city. Like I was able at, at 14, I was hopping on the metros, going all over the place, not a care in the world. There was a lot of petty crime. There was a lot of pickpocketing, uh, a lot of prostitution, a lot of like petty drugs. But as, as long as you weren't looking for trouble, you, no one was going to mess with you. You weren't going to get harmed. There was no violent crime. Right. So it was, a, it was a good time to be over there. Okay, cool. Yeah. And, it's, you know, especially given what you what your dad did at that time, and then what you went on to do. Um, it seems like diplomacy is in the family as, as well as being a soldier. So um, it's just an it's a fascinating time over there. I, I didn't go till uh, 10 years later. So I was just curious about your impressions as as just coming out of out of uh, communism. So because it's uh, like you said, when you go there now, I mean, it's got everything. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? As, like you said, everything shiny and American. But um, anyway, Okay, so uh, from there you you go to VMI. Talk a bit about your uh, experience at VMI. And I don't. I usually ask at this point, you know, what did your family think? With you, I don't need to because, <laughs> as you say, you went into the family business. Was your dad, uh, dad or mom, supportive? And then how was your VMI experience? Oh, I mean, my my parents were incredibly supportive. They knew from a very early age that this is what I want to do. And my dad, um, like we always knew what he did, mm -hmm. but there were, and he always told us about it and I probably bugged him way too much talking about it but there was never any pressure there was never any like you're gonna go into the military um I did my brother is a national guard off or warrant officer he was a he used to fly helicopters in Iraq oh, wow. uh for a brief period of time I was in Afghanistan he was in Iraq at the same time my mom I'm sure was going crazy <laughs> right um, right but you know my so there was no there was no expectation but there was always a familiarity on my part with what military service was all about. Not just what my dad did, but I was I was probably bugged his friends. My grandfather had been a Marine pilot, so I was asked my grandfather about his experiences. Um, so my parents were very supportive of, of the idea of, number one, me, me going to serve, and number two, uh, if I wanted to go to VMI, then, then they supported it. My dad went to Southern Cal. He was not at all a military academy type guy. As a matter of fact, his original plan uh, going to school uh, was to uh, pursue a career in the State Department, and then he changed his mind and joined the Army. Mm. Um, so, but when I got there, uh, so I, I try to explain, like, my oldest son is 17, and, and we just did some of the, the college tour locally here. And I try to explain to him how different it was for me. Number one, we're in Virginia. Uh, I can drive him to some of these places and have him show, you know, see these places. But number two, you can look up anything you want, uh, you know, on the internet. Ever, all the information that the, the school is putting out or these schools are putting out is available on the internet. That wasn't the case, obviously, for, for me in the, in the early 90s. Uh, so the first time I saw VMI was the night before matriculation. When we drove down to, like, you know, dump me out of the, the family minivan and into what is basically, you know, prison with classes during the day. Um, <laughs> And it was a little bit of a culture shock uh, for, for a couple of reasons, um, not the least of which was my experience was also so dissimilar from the people showing up there. Um, almost everybody had somebody else they knew from high school who was there. Most of, obviously, most of the guys came from Virginia and they were you know, from a smattering of either the same or, or local schools. Um, there were actually three of us all together who all went into Army ROTC, all were Army brats, and all happened to have just graduated from international school. So uh, I only knew one of them very well my, my rat year, uh, freshman year, but I, I got to know both of them. So th there were other people who had that same experience. But I remember it was always this, um, one of the common questions, you get stopped on the stoop, the, the little the floors inside the barracks, and the upperclassmen would ask you all kinds of questions. And a simple question, a, a gimme question for anybody else is, where are you from, rat? And my answer was, you know, Virginia. And they're like, no kidding. Everybody's from Virginia. Where'd you go to high school? Prague. What? Okay, <laughs> where were you born? Holland. Okay, so then I end up just pushing, you know, so because it just seems like I'm being a smart ass. Right. Um, but, um, you know, it, it was, uh, I always talk to, when people ask me if my kids 
are going to go to VMI, or whenever anybody asks me about you know going to VMI, uh, I always say you know it's a I knew people who went there because there were family expectations. Um, I think if you don't absolutely want to be there, you shouldn't seek out that kind of experience because I desperately wanted to be there. That was the only thing I wanted to go to was, was to a military school. And there were plenty of times I was absolutely miserable, uh, you know, by design. And I, and I kind of, you know, I look back on my college career and I, I value the, um, not, you know, I don't want to make it sound dramatic, but the, the, that crucible, that challenge, yep. I think, yep. bonded me better, better with my brother Atz and, and, you know, set me up for who I wanted to be. But right. if you don't want that experience, it's just going to be twice as miserable. So Right, right. Not... Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. But the my my marine recruiter said the same thing. Like, if you absolutely don't want to do this, because five times a day during OCS, you're gonna wish you were home. So you better mm -hmm. love it and you know really want to be here. So that's a that's a, a good way of putting it. Because especially that especially so young, you seem to be very dialed in. At I certainly wasn't dialed in at that age. So yeah, that's <laughs> that's. <laughs> I was a, um, I was a okay. weird kid. No, 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 no. Just just you had your head screwed on straight, and you didn't. You didn't grow up in California like I did, screwing around. So, uh, um, so VMI, you finish. Uh, do you commission immediately? Do you what? What's your next step from there? So, uh, like I said, I showed up ROTC scholarship. So it was great. I was like, I, I know what my job is on the back back side of this, as long as I don't fail out. Uh, so I majored in history because it's what I like. You know, I didn't have to have a practical major so to speak yeah right <laughs> you know i didn't have to go into the the history business i mean it's not very marketable um but uh uh though it was actually kind of cool the way we did it at vmi um so graduation was always on or as close to new market day as possible uh new market day is the day that you know the obviously vmi fought on the wrong side of the civil war right. uh, but 10 cadets died uh fighting at the battle of new market so they do mark that occasion um, and, uh, obviously, you know, along with the changes that are going on in the U S army, VMI has recently gone through a lot of changes about how, how it addresses its history. Um, but the, uh, uh, so we commissioned on May 14th, we had a ceremony the day before we graduated, um, then did the new market parade, then went and, and graduated the next day. Uh, so I graduated, uh, about a week later, give or take a couple of days, um, I had enough time to like go home, pack up all my stuff from my parents' house in Sterling in Northern Virginia, um, go see Star Wars Episode One, which had just come out. <laughs> uh, a huge disappointment. Um, sure and then, was. Yeah, sure was. And then uh, a bunch of us, there were three of us, or three of us there in Northern Virginia and another guy coming down from New York. But we'd all gone to VMI together, and then we were all showing up out at Fort Sill in the same uh, officer basic course uh, to be field artillerymen. So um, all four of us kind of carpool, drive out there. We break up two and two when you show up out there at Fort So at least we, 23 years ago, this is the way it was. There are these like uh, apartments that shared a, a kitchenette. Uh, so you'd be, you wouldn't have a roommate, but you'd have a suite mate. And we had already locked it in. So this guy, Ted, he was actually coincidentally one of the, the people. That, so he graduated from uh, international school in Athens. Oh, right. So we were paired up and then my friend, Aaron and Eric, uh, they were paired up. So the four of us showed up. Unlike my experience of showing up at VMI, I did have this base of people I knew in advance before showing up at OBC. Um, I was there for just, just about six months uh, for the basic course. And uh, I was lucky. I knew going into the basic course where I was going. Uh, three of, the, of those four of us that I told you about were all going to end up at the 82nd Airborne Division. So after we graduated, Eric went off to uh, Hawaii, and the other three of us went to North Carolina and started our careers in the 82nd. Okay, I, w I always ask this. Uh, anybody any uh, anybody stick out to you in that basic course? Because sometimes, you know, people have some funny memories, but also maybe maybe you meet a mentor or two there. So I always ask it anyway. Um, sometimes not. But did you anybody stick out to you uh, from that experience? Well, one of the, the weird experiences of the Army across the board is you realize uh, how infinitely small the world gets with, you know, uh, limitless iterations of chances to bump into people all right. over the world. Um, it, it's, it's, it's funny how you make connections early on that, that last. So there was a, I'll, I'll get to this later because it's towards the tail end of my career or towards the tail end of the cool parts of my career. 
uh, but there was a guy that was in our OBC class. Uh, he'd gone to the University of Oklahoma, so none of us knew him beforehand, but we, we came to know him throughout the course of OBC. This guy, uh, uh, another guy named Mike. Uh, Mike and I went to OBC. We went to the 82nd together. We went to Special Forces selection together. We showed up at 5th Special Forces group in the same battalion together. We went to grad school together. We went back to 5th Special Forces group, different battalions, but both filling the same roles as battalion XOs. Uh, and then we ended up uh, both working on the, the Syria part of the, the ISIS problem very early on in the war uh, against ISIS. But uh, And then um, Ted, obviously, I stayed in touch with. He's my oldest son, the one doing the college tour. He's my oldest son's godfather. Um, and uh, not so much there... Uh, but there was another mentor. He'd actually been one of our ROTC instructors, uh, a guy at the time named Major Pitcock. He uh, he had grown up in the 82nd as a lieutenant. He jumped into Panama, did the combat jump into Panama. Mm -hmm. And so we all kind of like, oh, wow, that's cool. Major Pitcock or Captain and Major Pitcock had, you know, jumped into combat. And we all wanted to be paratroopers like him. And uh, he was back at the 82nd Division Artillery when we all were graduating and we contacted him and we said, Hey, we're going to Fort Bragg. We want to make sure we end up in the 82nd. And so he looked out for us. And then when we all showed up, we you know did an office call by him and he stayed in touch with the most of us while we were in the field or just so happens of the three of us who went to the 82nd, um, Aaron and I both went special forces and Ted got out after his, his initial, uh, commitment. So none of us stayed artillerymen, mm -hmm. but, uh, mm -hmm. but major Pickock did mentor us a little bit. Interesting. Yeah. Like I said, always ask because sometimes guys just have some really uh, key people that enter their lives at that point. But that uh, the story with Ted, you guys' careers just mirrored each other uh, mm -hmm. all the way, which is, I, I assume, rare. But uh, OK, so off to North Carolina, um, you really when you said family business, you really meant it. artillery. You went right to the same as dad. Right. So, uh, yeah. Um, OK, so you get out to North Carolina. Where are you? What's your job? What are you, what are you doing at that point? So I show up, um, they, they, there was some, uh, I don't know, when we showed up, we kind of caught our battalion by surprise. They weren't expecting us for another like month or two. So Ted and I literally went to the same battalion. Uh, and then Aaron went to first to the 319th. We were both, Ted and I were in second 319th. And we, uh, so we walk in and they're like, oh man, we got to find jobs for you. Uh, you know, they, they, they forecast jobs for us, but not, so the two places we were going weren't yet unoccupied. Um, so we were both, both going to become what are called company fire support officers. So our job is to run a fire support team. So in every platoon of roughly 40 infantrymen, there's a forward observer, an artilleryman who walks with the, the infantry and whose job it is to call for fire and more importantly, integrate and coordinate those fires to make sure they support the maneuver plan to control them because it's, it's a three dimensional battlefield. We think a lot, you know, people who've seen, you know, depictions of combat, uh, it's it's very focused on the two dimensional, the the maneuvering on the ground and the shooting at things in with what, what are called direct fires, right? What you can see. Uh, artillery is a three dimensional fight. It's coming in from from over the horizon uh, and impacting around the infantry, and you've got to be able to turn it on, turn it off, uh, and make sure it supports what they're trying to do in a safe manner. Uh, well, safe manner for us and a lethal manner against the enemy. Uh, we can see every so often these things happen, and as a artilleryman during the invasion of Iraq and still having you know a connection every so often these things happen where the the utility and usefulness of artillery is seen and it, and the infantrymen like oh yeah i guess that's what you've been talking about for a while so right now what you see the ukrainians using high mars for like that, that right. you know that warms my heart um <laughs> right, so right. you have one forward observer per platoon three platoons in a in a rifle company so there's three forward observers that work for a fire support officer and a fire support nco at the company headquarters so my job was basically to walk, you know, alongside that infantry company commander, understand his company plan, integrate what my platoon forward observers were doing around the infantry platoons into the overall battalion plan. Um, so it was a, um, so when I showed up, I was going to go be the fire support officer for Charlie Company, first of 325. Um, the, when I showed up, they were about to go do a, an exchange uh, training with the German army. So they had just left to go on this trip, and they're like, well, your job is not here. It's over in Germany. So you're going to fill in for somebody um, in uh, Bravo Company while he's he's off doing some training. So I, I went to the field 
for the first time with uh, Bravo Company first 325. And it was like, it was kind of my experience at, at VMI, you know, kind of a, not a rude awakening, but a shocking awakening. Uh, one thing I loved about the 82nd is there, there, it was training to standard, right? It was, it was training to be hard. It was meant to be difficult all the time. There was nothing phoned in. Um, and so my, I remember my first drop zone mission. So I've been to airborne school at this point in time. I went to airborne school as a cadet, uh, which is literally just to train you the technical skills of parachuting, uh, static line parachuting. But now I'm putting it into operation in the 82nd, you know, with around all these things. So I, I like the idea of finding my way to the assembly area in a tactical environment under nods when there are no bright lights, um, putting my radio into op operation. These were all like, oh my gosh, I'm doing all these skills like in short succession in a stressful environment because they all these little finite tasks matter. Um, and it was it was a, it was a you know a good education for a then just turned 22 year old lieutenant. Um, so I, I did that. Coincidentally, the fire support NCO who went to the field with me later also went to special forces and served with me in fifth special forces group. Uh, I didn't I didn't know that. I saw him in group. I was like, wait a minute, what are you doing here? Um, so, uh, sorry, real quick. Sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Real quick, can you get? Is this uh, late nineties? This is when this is happening. Mid late nineties, or so I I showed up in the division in November of ninety nine. Okay, really, right, right at yeah. the millennium. Okay, right at two thousand, almost. Yeah. Okay, and, sorry, I just uh, wanted to get a time frame. No, no, you're good. So I, uh, I, um, so I, I I continue doing that job for Charlie Company first three two five, um, and about. Midway through 2000, we find out we're going to go to Kosovo to for the peacekeeping operation there. Mm -hmm. And at the time, in 2000, you know this is the this is the biggest show in town. That's right. um, the 82nd used to, or they still do. They, they've changed the name of it, but we used to do what was called the Division Ready Brigade, the DRB. So a third of the division at any given time was on uh, two-hour recall, right? So literally, call comes in to Fort Bragg. And within two hours, the entire, well, the, the lead battalion needs to be completely assembled from wherever they live with their weapons drawn out of the arms room, ready to, to deploy. And that, and then there's more to the sequence, but the idea is from phone call to wheels up at, at Pope Army Airfield, taking off to go anywhere in the world, 18 hours to be ready to go. Um, which sounds like a lot of time, and it really isn't when you've got all those tasks done. But so you, um, you can't, so, go to, can't go to Disney World on the weekend for that one. No. <laughs> so, yeah, you, I mean, you literally, I mean, if I, dating myself a little bit, uh, this is what caused me to get a cell phone. You know, in the 90s, that to me was a sign of affluence. Right. Uh, and I showed up and they were like, y you have two choices, get a cell phone, or anytime you leave your house to go to the grocery store, you call staff duty and say, this is Lieutenant Nelson. The time is now X. I am departing for the grocery store. It takes me 15 minutes to drive there. The phone number at the grocery store is this. I will recontact you when I am back from the grocery store. And no kidding, like calling will Lieutenant Nelson, please come to the service desk, you know, or whatever it is. <laughs> so, so I was like, all right, I'm getting a cell phone. That sounds yeah, like far too phone, much work. Yeah. But um, so the reason I I, I, I say this is because like there was this culture in the 82nd. Like we always thought, like, oh man, there's going to be some weird, you know, like there are all kinds of weird things. We're going to get involved. We're going to have to jump in and do something about the blood diamond mines or anything, anything that yep. we saw in the news. We're like, oh man, this is it. They're going to call us. You can't, you know, it's been a while since the 82nd's done anything. So obviously we're due. So when we uh, got the call to go to Kosovo, we thought like, you know, this is the big adventure. Um, and I mean, we took it very seriously, but like we were, uh, you know, we were there to peacekeep and there was still violence taking place between uh, remnants of the UCK and the UCPMB and some of these other Albanian separatist organizations. And we got involved in some operations coordinated with the Macedonians because they were basically trying to uh, go back and forth, uh, conduct insurgent strikes in, in out in Macedonia or the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia to be official. Um, and uh, and so, but when I remember when we came back from that, uh, my buddy Ted, the 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 VMI mm -hmm. guy who graduated from high school in Athens, we looked at each other on the way home and we we're like, I guess that was it. I guess that was our great adventure, right? This was our you know. Um, our, 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 our big calling. So we come back in the summer of 2001. 
Mm. Uh, we go on leave. We come back. I change jobs. Uh, actually, Ted and I both change jobs. I become the fire direction officer of Alpha Battery 2nd 319th. Which, by the way, I know uh, we talked beforehand, you know, being a sports guy, uh, Bob Kalsu, who was the only NFL player killed in Vietnam, oh, right, that's right, the right. job he had when he was killed. He was the, the fire direction officer of Alpha Battery 2nd 319th. So, um, uh, so I take I that didn't job. That. I didn't know that. Yeah. I, well, so that big Sports Illustrated profile on him came out literally when I was in that job. And I was like, oh, my gosh, uh, you know, what a coincidence. Yeah, um, yeah. So and my buddy Ted goes over to be the fire direction officer in Charlie Battery. Uh, I'm sorry, Bravo Battery. Um, and we go out on a couple. And so this this job, the the, the idea is. We take the calls for fire from the forward observers or whoever's calling in the, the fire mission and actually do the computations to then tell the gun line, you need to elevate this high and slew this far left or right. And that's going to make this bullet travel, you know, around the globe and land at this place, uh, you know, a, a couple kilometers in the distance. So we went on a couple of field training exercises to get ready to be, you know, qualified to do that. And we're doing the culmination. So those that mission cycle I talked about, you do mission cycle, which was on recall, ready to go. Then you'd go on uh, kind of a recovery cycle, which was leave all the maintenance. You need to do all the support tasks around all the, the, the horrible taskings that, you know, Fort Bragg needed. And then you'd go into what's, what's called ITC, intensive training cycle. And so for two months, you're just like going to the woods, going to the field, training, getting ready to go back on mission cycle to be ready if the call comes. So we're finishing up the last part of ITC. We're doing the Brigade FTX. Uh, and, and um, you know, this is the culminating event. And it was supposed to be, a, I think, a 12-day FTX, if memory serves. And I think we were on like day eight of it. And I'll never forget uh, one of my soldiers, Private Yuri Ostegi, uh Private First Class Yuri Ostegi, had a uh, a watchman once again dating myself like we thought you know <laughs> that he'd right. smuggled in his rucksack and and uh, but it was almost out of batteries so he wasn't there was no video he could just hear what was on TV and we were in a lull in between fire missions so he had he was just listening to the news and he speaks up from the back of the fire direction center and says hey a plane just hit the World Trade Center wow and because we have no video everyone's thinking you know okay got it uh cessna boy uh, you know pilots probably not doing all right but i hope i hope everything gets controlled and then a couple minutes later he's like a second one just hit the other tower and the pentagon you know and i'll never forget that like there was no call that went out on the brigade net at least none that i remember like hey stop the stop the the training exercise it just did like word had just trickled out that something had happened and then we just paused and everybody's like out in the field just sitting like not sure are we going to restart are we going to war tomorrow what's going on uh and then we get the word we we get recalled like we need 100 the division commander wants 100 percent accountability everybody back you know from the field everybody in make sure we know where everybody is and you know we'll get our ducks in a row so we we cut the ftx short by about two days we're driving in it is pure chaos there are checkpoints set up randomly all over Fort Bragg. We get stopped with our convoy of, you know, green trucks and howitzers coming back into the containment area and searched. And I was like, well, I can tell you we've got weapons. They're right here. Yeah, you know, right. You can so see I, I don't right know what here. you're looking for. And and you're setting up a checkpoint from one side of Fort Bragg to another. It's not like you're preventing anybody else. So, but it, I mean, MPs were just all over the place searching. Every, I got searched leaving Fort Bragg that night. Um, and the next morning, I knew it was going to be bad. So Fort Bragg had been an entirely open post by that point in time. So anybody could drive on. Civilians, pizza delivery guy, anybody could drive on post. Uh, and the gates were all open. And it went from being an open post on September 11th to a incredibly closed post on the morning of September 12th, where not only was everybody getting stopped, they were doing 100% search. Like every cranny of your car was getting searched. So I left for work that day. Uh, at about three in the morning, because I knew so I knew it was going to be bad, and I got there I think about seven, and we had wow. NCOs who left. Like I remember one, um, one of our NCOs, he showed up at you know five thirty in his PT uniform because that's when he finally got in after having trying to make it there by six o'clock in the morning. 
Um, we had guys ran, ran out of gas, parked out on or idling out on Yadkin Just Drive, trying to idling. Get yeah. yeah. So it, it was it was chaos. But what was what we were convinced was we're about to take mission cycle. You know, we're about to be the mission brigade and a war is coming and you can't have a war without the 82nd. So we're going to war. Right. Um, and so we did take mission cycle a couple of days later and we're sitting here and we're like counting down. Like, of course, we're going to get called. Of course, we're going to go. And then we go watch you know, the news when Ranger Regiment jumps in in late October and does the, the, the jump on Objective Rhino. And, you know, all the SF teams are off doing Task Force Dagger, guys that I later got to know uh, are doing great things. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, our buddy Aaron, the one I told you about who came to the 82nd, had left actually that summer to go off to 3rd Ranger Battalion. So he was on that jump. He jumped into oh, to wow. Afghanistan. Wow. Um, so we're all, we're all like, it's just a matter of time. Um, and, uh, you know, mid November, I remember like the day that we were switching over to third brigade for mission cycle, we're like counting down on our watches. Like it hasn't switched yet. They can still call us and it didn't happen. And I, I mean, there've been a lot of times in my life that I've had this like feeling of helplessness or uselessness, but that day I think I was just like, what's the point? Why, why are we even here? We're not going to get called. The rest of the army is going to go fight this war and we're not. Um, but by that time, I had already put in my packet to go to selection. Okay. Uh, so we sat back for basically all of 2002 and watched, you know, the, the we got to go to NTC twice, the National Training Center. We got to do that twice because everybody else was off doing stuff. But we got to watch the other two brigades of the division send at least part of their people. All the uh, independent support brigades that were on Fort Bragg go, both special forces groups that were on Bragg. So we were like the only brigade size element on Bragg left untouched by the war in, in any way, shape, or form. Um, so I go to selection. Uh, so the way it works for Army Special Forces, um, you have to do a couple years, uh, at least uh, as a conventional Army soldier, you know, to have a traditional MOS, and then you can go, you can apply to go to selection, which is three weeks long. It's not instruction. They don't teach you anything about being a Green Beret. It's just, we're going to give you some, you know, really horrible stuff to do, and we're going to see how you do. Uh, and uh, it's just a tryout. Do you have the basic raw material that we can later train? So I did that in uh, October, November of, uh, of 2002. In fact, I turned 25 uh, on the long range, long range uh, team track, which is the, the last event of selection. Um, came back, got selected, was feeling really good about that. You know, I was like, all right, great. Uh, I'll, I'll go off to be an SF guy. Um, and so I got scheduled to go, uh, they cut my orders to send me to the infantry advanced course in March of 2003 and then follow on, uh, to the Q course. Yep. Well, in December of 2002, our brigade gets the warning order that we're getting ready to deploy to Kuwait. So we know what's coming. Cause you're still, and, uh, sorry, sorry, real quick. You're still part yeah. of 82nd at this point, right? Like you're right. still... Yep. So selection is, is what we call TDY, right? You just go yep. for three weeks and then return yep. to your unit and then they yep. figure it out later. Because the guys who don't get selected, they just return to normal life. No, right no shame, there. no foul, just you continue on. Gotcha. Um, so I'm supposed to leave in March, but in December I find out my brigade is going to go invade Iraq. So uh, I call Special Forces Branch and say, hey, look, I need to, I need to postpone going to the advanced course and the Q course because I'm going to go invade Iraq. And they're right. like, uh, no, you aren't. You're, you're on orders. You need to, uh, you need to, you know, continue on with your training. And I was like, no, 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 you don't get it. Like, I'm going to go invade Iraq. <laughs> and I keep getting punted up. So it's, there's this guy who's in charge of all the captains who who are in the pipeline for training. Then I get kicked up to his boss. And then finally I'm talking to the, the actual SF branch manager, this lieutenant colonel whose job is to manage all the personnel issues for a special force branch. And, and he goes, look, you need to just worry about getting through training, getting to a team. This war is not going anywhere. Mm. And I remember, you know, when I look back on some of my youthful folly, uh, I remember saying to him, sir, this war is going to be over in six weeks. <laughs> and, well, I was about to say, boy, was he prophetic on that one. Right. Yeah. So I was like, I got to get mine because, you know, this <laughs> right. peace is going to break out here pretty soon. Right. And I, you right. Know, I, was, I was bitter at having missed Afghanistan. So, um so finally he goes, okay, check it out. 
you've been selected. Like you have, you know, the, 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 you, you passed that. So just tell me if you want FA branch to manage your file again, and then give us a call when you're ready to go to, go to the queue course. I was like, Oh, that's it, that easy. Sure. Yeah. Let's do that. So, uh, I get, uh, so I, I've pinned on captain at this point in time, got basically got promoted out of my job. I'd been a battery XO, which is the, the second in charge of a battery, uh, to the battery commander. And then, um, I go to, so I, I'm back from selection. I don't really have, uh, I, I, they made me like this additional floating fires officer that's kind of sitting around the battalion. And, and so they they start cutting down numbers. So we're getting deployed because the mission that we were deployed for was to do an airfield seizure to, to parachute onto Baghdad International Airport, or at the time, Saddam International Airport. <laughs> um, and so there are going to be a limited number of people who are actually going to do the jump. I think we had about 2,000 shoots to plan with. And so they start cutting down who's actually going to Kuwait. So as an example, our normal a battalion, a field artillery battalion at the time was three six-gun batteries, so 18 total howitzers. Instead, we deployed to Kuwait with two four-gun batteries. So we left behind, uh, you know, 10 uh, of the 18 guns in that in that battalion, uh, the whole Charlie battery and two gun teams off of, of Alpha and Bravo batteries. Uh, so I get added as the assistant brigade FSO. So now, like I said, for what I was doing as a company FSO, I fleet it up to the brigade level. There's a major whose job it is the primary, and I'm his I'm his deputy. Um, so we get to Kuwait. We deploy on Valentine's. I remember that. Uh, so we, we deploy on Valentine's Day, show up in Kuwait, and, and then we just immediately start going into planning and prep for the invasion. Uh, and we're planning all kinds of contingencies uh, for the jump on BIOP. Mm -hmm. um, and the big question, everyone's like, okay, so when is A day? When's the air war kicking off? And when is G day? When's the, when's the ground war kicking off? And it was, uh, and we all thought, you know, our division commander, General Swanick, had called all the captains and above who were deploying for a little uh, all call before we deployed. And he told us, you guys are going to go there, stage in Kuwait for about six, two weeks, jump onto BIOP, hold the airfield for about two weeks before 3rd Infantry Division can get to you. And then we're going to fly back on the airfield, back to Kuwait, package our stuff, put it on boats and, and air, aircraft, and that'll take about two weeks. So he goes, we're going to be there six weeks total, maybe three months. I was like, yeah, that that's, sounds exactly like my my belief. Right. Uh, it didn't turn out that way. <laughs> so um, so we're just sitting in Kuwait for you know about a month and a half, uh, wow. waiting for well, I guess about five weeks, waiting for the war to kick off. Um, and finally, uh, as as the war does kick off, third IDs cross the berm, the air war is going on. And we're sitting here, I think, you know, like the two or three days we're sitting in Kuwait, we're like, still itchy. Oh, we're going to miss the war. It's all going to be over. Third ID is moving too fast. Um, and there was one day, we're sitting here watching the video or the, the, the images that are coming in of the airfield on BIOP, the one we're going to do an airfield seizure on. And it becomes, it's slightly cratered at the beginning of the day. Mm -hmm. But our engineers can fix it. And we're like, all right, that's fine. Because the whole point of doing an airfield seizure is to be able to Control that train so you can bring in follow-on aircraft, bring in heavier equipment. Um, and then by the end of the day, it's cratered to the point where our engineers can't fix it, and there's no point in seizing the airfield anymore. It's mission's off. So we're already kind of demoralized. Uh, and then we wake up the next morning to CNN showing us the 173rd Airborne Brigade jumping into northern Iraq. So we were doubly demoralized then. And now we didn't have a mission. You know, we were kind of... Uh, We'd been called to do one thing, and now we're just sitting in Kuwait watching 3rd ID move towards Baghdad. And in the aftermath of the, the incident with Jessica Lynch, mm -hmm. what what uh, 5th Corps, who was the, the ground component commander for the invasion, realized was 3rd ID was doing such a good job just going through the Iraqi army and the Republican Guard like a you know, knife through butter. But, and their whole job was to get to Baghdad as fast as possible to control the center of gravity. Um, but what, what they weren't doing, because that wasn't their job, was to clear all the population centers that they were going past on Highway 8 all the way up to Baghdad. You know, their job was to get there as quickly as possible. 
And what I was leaving was unprotected pockets of Iraqi army and the Saddam Fadayeen who were conducting ambushes and, and like what happened to Jessica Lynch's company. So we get our mission. We're going to follow behind the aftermath of Third ID and start clearing out cities. And our first fight uh, is this place called the Samoa, uh, just down on the, on the banks of the Euphrates. Um, so we ended up, you know, convoying, driving from Kuwait up to Talil Airfield, staging there for a night. And then we, we start kicking off the fight in a Samoa the next day with the brigade. Um, this was a great time to be an artilleryman. Uh, it was a great time to be a soldier in general, I think. Uh, I was sleeping probably about an hour a night. We weren't eating. There wasn't enough water. It was hot. And it was great. Because uh, we were, every, it was, it was fair, I mean, it was a complicated situation. Uh, but from how we understood it and how we approached it, it was fairly clear cut, right? We were doing traditional um, military combined arms maneuver tasks. The infantry was trying to move to a certain phase line every day. We were facilitating that if they were either taking fire and calling for fire, or we were doing a lot of counter battery fire. So uh, the Saddam Fadayin would fire mortars, our Q36 radars would pick up where the, the mortars had come from, and we'd immediately respond and hit that mortar crew uh, before they had a chance to shoot again. So we were doing that, it was probably about five days that it took us, I think, to, to clear out of Samoa. It culminated on either April 1st or April 2nd, I remember it was when we finally pushed onto the, the north side of the Euphrates and, and cleared out the town. Um, and then we continued doing that for the rest of the invasion, basically going, and that was, that was they'd pushed most of their resistance down there to, to fight us in Samoa. Everything there all the way up to Diwania was fairly easy. We'd come to a town and whoever was there would, would, would clear out. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, we, we spent, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I just had a bunch of questions i won't i won't i don't no, want to no, get no, you sorry, off track ahead, but ahead, no 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 it's it's cool I, it's it's awesome believe me uh i just was there's a few questions that pop into mind um and this is let me start with a dumb civilian question about artillery do you have a do you have an ideal like an ideally placed distance between where you place your howitzer or your artillery pieces and your infantry front line in other words when you're planning it out, obviously it changes in, the, in the, the capability of the individual gun you have and all that stuff. But is there an ideal place behind or, you know, how far you want them away from you? So you've got you, you got this thing called the flot, the forward line of troops, right? And that's like that's the front line, so to speak. That's where the infantry is. No kidding. Rounds are flying between the infantry and, and the adversary. Um, you have got your max effective range of your weapon system. Uh, for our howitzers, it was just just past 11 kilometers. Uh, okay. For the the larger ones that uh, most of the military has gone to, the the 155s. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we introduced the M777s after I left the artillery, so forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think it's about 19 kilometers okay. and a little further with rocket assisted. But um, we uh, so you kind of tend to want to be have at least two thirds of your range forward okay. of the flot. Uh, you want to. A, be in a place where your artillery soldiers don't have to be in direct fire, right? Because that's not their job. Their job is to be running those guns to uh, uh, to, to fire at the enemy, enemy. And you also have to recognize you are in an artillery duel as well. Uh, they, the enemy is going to try to do counter-battery on you as well. So the batteries are actually usually moving. And that's one of the reasons you have multiple batteries in a, in a battalion. The, batter, or the, the battalion is managing... All right, Alpha Battery's in position, ready to fire. They're able to answer calls for fire. We're moving Charlie Battery. They're going to be in position, ready to fire at this time. Alpha Battery's fired a bunch. They need to move before they get counter battery. So you're constantly hopscotching these, these batteries around to, number one, be in a position to better support the troops, but also for survivability. So uh, now in a Samoa, that wasn't really a factor. Uh, we got in position, ready to fire. We could range. We had our two batteries up and running. They could range the whole city within uh, uh without moving after that first emplacement and uh we like i don't think we the artillerymen ever got mortar fire uh largely they were busy trying to to suppress our infantry and number two as soon as they shot we were well i think we we shot more counter battery than anything else we were doing mm -hmm. a whole lot of that mm -hmm. and your and your role uh is it similar uh, to what JTACs do in the Air Force in, in terms of, because you were talking about being up there and calling in, because when, when you see that, obviously, in depictions of it, you have to be kind of close to call it in sometimes, right? So I think that's how you described your job, if I'm wrong. So at this Am point I'm in time, I, I mean, I'm not, 
there's there's this whole like uh if uh I'm trying to think of a good analogy for this and I'm not coming up with one, but you know, no. along the infantry formations you have this like spine of artillerymen all through it. So the what you're describing, that's the platoon forward observer. That's okay. usually a young sergeant who's sitting there next to that platoon leader saying, I literally see what I'm I'm shooting at and I'm calling it in. Then you've got the company fire support officers, battalion fire support officers, okay. brigade fire support officer talking to the field artillery battalion who's delegating these tasks down to the individual guns, to the individual, or I'm sorry, the individual batteries to be able to, to facilitate all that. It's, it's, a, it's, there's, it's like a fine ballet. There's all this these different pieces that go to this all crew served solution where when that young sergeant says, I need fires on this grid, that howitzer is doing it in a way that supports the overall plan, not just the, the, the field artillery movement, not just the ammunition management, but also, like I said, that, that, that maneuver. So my job at this time, uh, so trying to maintain survivability, normally a lot of our, our command posts break up when we're in a fight. So you have the talk and the TAC, the Tactical Operations Center and the Tactical, uh, actually, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank as to what the TAC is, but it's it's the mobile version. So we had the brigade commander and some of his immediate staff in a couple trucks that were moving separately so that if either of us got hit, there's still something in control of the brigade. Right. Uh, the brigade FSO was with him. I was running the fires back in the brigade CP. So my job was primarily to take all the inputs from the various platoon forward observers who were being trickled to me from the three battalions that we have fighting for us, first, second, third, and three, two, five. So I have three battalion FSOs talking to me, as well as the Q36 radar, which is finding uh, counter battery, gotcha. and kind of determining how we're shaping our, or I am telling the field artillery battalion where our priorities are as a brigade so that they can support it with what assets they've got up and ready gotcha, to fire. Gotcha. So you're out there spinning plates right now. You're that that you're trying to make sure everything is coordinated. Okay. I gotcha, mean it, gotcha. it's 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 literally like this whole spine of everybody's incredibly busy. We're all James Browns, right? Hardest working right. man in show business. <laughs> also that that one for observer who is no kidding, like getting round zipping by his head is is getting the fires he needs. Okay. So um, yeah I didn't mean to make you go too far into the tech no, no, leads. No, no. I just I've always been I've always been curious about that. So how that works, because, you know, obviously in a really kinetic situation, um, those are big guns, right? Those 155, right. they're big guns. And to, it's just to so get up and move those quick. Oh, 105, sorry. We one, I'm yeah, we had 105s. Okay. So, okay. So they're a little yeah. more mobile, but, yeah. but, uh, but they, still. They had to be air, they had to be air droppable, right? So okay. They, they, gotcha. Gotcha. But, gotcha. Uh, gotcha. But still, okay. you know, they can, they can rain some scunion down. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, okay, and then I want to go real quick, and we'll go right back up to where to, to the to where you are presently talking about um, your time in the Balkans. Um, doesn't have to be military, or whatever. What is your What are some impressions of the Balkans? I've been there a few times. I think it's a fascinating and beautiful place, uh, but crazy history. So at this time, mm -hmm. your what are your what are your impressions of Kosovo and and what you're seeing there? So just I was in a in a uh, um, uh, I, I was in a not a, a mid sized city I guess uh, called Vitina. That's where we were. Our our, our company headquarters was, uh, and at this point in time, I'm still the FSO for Charlie First Three Two Five. Um, we uh, were living out of what had been a shoe manufacturing factory. I understand until it had been repurposed to be the compound for the American company. Um, and Vatina itself is is pretty, but it's it's like a it's a Eastern European little town. You know, there there's some uh, not so well maintained buildings around, but in general, it's a pretty area. But as soon as we went south of there, there was a, a little town called Binox that we were also responsible for patrolling. And you get out there, and you're kind of out in the woods, in the mountains. It was and around Binox, there were a couple of other smaller towns that we were responsible for. And it's just like this untouched beauty. Yeah. Um, I remember thinking at one point in time we were doing so we would every so often uh, go out there as forward observers and fire illumination rounds from our battery into these valleys because uh, they were meant to deter the smuggling operations that the UCPMB and other organizations were doing across the border back and forth between Macedonia. And uh, we're just set up on this hilltop, a uh, little um, OP, 
getting ready to call these observation missions. But it's right before the sun goes down. And I remember thinking, if, if somebody turned this area into a ski resort, that you know, it, it, because it's just like I said, this pristine, untouched beauty. Yeah. Um, and I had similar impressions as well uh, of parts of the Middle East. I remember seeing uh, there are parts of Afghanistan that it's tragic the world will never see because yeah. everyone's got the the view of like Helmand and Kandahar, the desert, or you know Jabad and, and other parts of the the Hindu Kush and the and the and the mountains. Uh, but there were parts like in in Bogland province. I remember looking and I was like, if Peter Jackson had made The Hobbit or, or Lord of the Rings, like it looked like this kind of like fantasy environment. These weird green islands in the middle of a river. It was just beautiful. Um, but unfortunately, it's full of people who want to kill each other. So you know, yeah. it's it's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not going to be a tourist hub for a while. No, no, no. But those are one of those kind of uh, weird juxtapositions or ironies or whatever the right word is when you doing your job where you all of a sudden you stop and you're have this mental frame that you're fighting you know you're you're, right. you're fighting but then you look at this just spectacular beauty and and um i was when i was in mostar in bosnia and and you know looking up these mountains or taking the train through bosnia and i was just like these people have been fighting and killing each other for since alexander the great and down in macedonia and and but I'm looking at these mountains that are, like you said, something out of a Peter Jackson movie or something out of a, you know, a painting. And so anyway, it's just kind of, I was just curious to get your impression because that mm -hmm. place, the Balkans generally, wherever I went all over it, and it just kind of, it was, it was a striking place. It's really, a really interesting place. So I just was curious to get your impressions of that place. Anyway. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and then bringing yourself back to, uh, to selection and, um, getting into special forces, um, can you talk a bit about what is the, what is the sep, what's the, first of all, what's the attrition rate going through selection? Mm -hmm. And then what did you notice in terms that were commonalities in people, the guys that made it? So, uh, so there's a, there's a slightly different process between officers and NCOs and sergeants, okay. right? Uh, for selection. Um, or at least there was when I went through. Um, I mean, the events are the same, like mm -hmm. we're, we're doing the same tasks. Uh, but for us, excuse me, we were number one, we had to stay extra, uh, about a day longer to do a set of boards, right? An interview, everyone had to go through a, a shrink interview. So for the NCOs, basically if their psych profile, if there was something that caused questions, then they would go do a, a, a shrink interview. Uh, the officers, all of us had to do a shrink interview. And then afterwards we went to a board with the, the battalion commander, the battalion sergeant major, uh, and a bunch of our instructors who would, you know, basically try to put us in situations to answer difficult questions and make it make it really uncomfortable. Uh, and then after that, you found out if you were selected. So the the first process for us was you had to you basically had to put in an application to go to selection. Mm -hmm. um, and it's you know based on my time in the army or what you can tell of my time in the army from my my you know my OERs, my report cards. Uh, are you even interested in letting me try? Because they have a limited number of slots and they get they, they need to pick just the people that they think are most likely to succeed. Uh, so about half of the, the guys who drop those applications, it's the process has changed a little bit since I went, but uh, about half of those just didn't get the invite. Okay. They just got told like, hey, thanks, but uh, you're, you're not going to invite it. Um, when I showed up, we started with 44 officers in my, in my selection course. Um, 20 finished the course and 17 of those 20 were selected. Okay. Um, what got overwhelmingly, what got people, what caused people to not finish selection is quitting. Uh, oh. there, it's just the, like, this sucks. Yeah. Uh, and then, then there are injuries, obviously those happen too. And then the only, so the, one of the things that's great about selection is for 90% of the events, you have no idea what the standard is. Mm. They just tell you. So you'll show up. There's this big whiteboard that tells you what to do. And it'll say, be standing outside at five in the morning in this uniform with a rucksack that weighs at least this much. Mm. And you're like, okay. And you show up and they say, all right, you're all here. Start walking that way. Follow the arrows. You'll be told when to stop. And you don't know how fast you have to do it, how long you're going. You're just told to do your best. And there's 
there's an expression, don't be last, don't be late, don't be light, right? So don't don't be the last one to finish anything. If there is a time standard, a drop dead time, don't pass that. And don't be light on the weight that you're, because they, they, they'll weigh your ruck at the end of the event. If you're a right. pound shy, you are light. And and that's dry weight. So, you know, you, after you drink all your water, inevitably on the event, you have to make sure that you're still making weight. So um, the only thing they would tell you the standard for, so that's, you go on these long runs, you go on these long road marches, you have the, the Nasty Nick obstacle course, uh, you have a couple other physical events that they just don't tell you the standard for. And then the only thing that they do is uh, what's called the star course, which is long range land navigation. So you start every morning at like two in the morning, you got your rucksack on, you're at your, your start point, and you've got about 12 hours to cover four points across the Hoffman training area probably works out to maybe 30 kilometers worth of walking uh, wow. throughout that day. Um, so you're moving out. And when I went, they told us, and they didn't always do this. Uh, I was the first class of a fiscal year, so they'd implemented the changes like right when when we went. Um, but they told us, okay, the, the standard is you have to get at least 12 points and you get to do the star course four times. So if you can get 12 points in three attempts, you don't have to do the fourth one. Mm -hmm. If you never get 12 points, then you have failed. But everything else, you may have failed the event, the road march on the second day, and they don't tell you, and you just keep going, already with this mark against you. So, so the, the what over, quitting, a couple injuries, and then failures on the star course. So those are what prevented people from, from finishing at the end. Um, and, and they and tell are they you... Sorry, Sorry, real quick. Are they are they trying to get? Um, and I assume they're trying to see by not giving you these, uh, you know, defined end goals, right? So much. Um, I assume they're trying to just see how you respond mentally and push through things I, more than anything, right? Because I'm assuming everybody there is pretty physically fit, um, you know, can pass that part of it. And uh, I'm assuming at that point it's mindset, uh, that type of thing. The, the, I mean, the whole idea is generally to give you as little feedback as as possible. You're not going to be given an attaboy and you're also not going to be told you suck. Um, the, if you, the nasty Nick, for example, if you fall off an obstacle, you know, you slip and you, you fall off one, all they'll say is candidate, you failed to negotiate this obstacle. Do you wish to reattempt? Right? It's not get back mm. up there. You know, it's not yelling at you. It's mm. not, are you okay? It's just, you did not negotiate this obstacle. Do you wish to reattempt? And they're just seeing if you are going to reattempt. Um, the, uh, the the whole idea is to see, I guess, what you are going to do in an environment where you might be by yourself and no one else is motivating you and nobody else is checking on you. Mm -hmm. um, there are ways in place to make sure, like there's, it, the Hoffman training area is pretty big and there are like fire breaks and trails on there and you can't use them, right? You have to navigate through the woods and they do have little like ambushes set up where they're hiding in the woods to catch people that they see do that. So that there are feedback to make sure that you're being honest about what you're being assessed on. Uh, but generally it's just, do you want to do it or not? It's no skin off my nose if you don't. Well, um, and that goes along, that goes along with the overall mission of special, I mean, the, you know, the oppressive Libra, you know, you're dropped mm -hmm. in with indigenous forces. So uh, that makes sense because you, uh, you're going to spend a large part of your career, I assume in very, in either by yourself or in very small groups among, you know, people that don't look like you talk like you or whatever. So you have to be of a, uh, have, pretty high integrity and be a self a self starter motivator. So that makes sense. I was just curious about the mindset. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the idea. And, and I, I'm not trying to talk bad about them, but my, one of my instructors later in the Q course uh, pointed out, he said, this is the difference in mindset between us and seals, right? You see, watch mm -hmm. the videos of the seals at buds and they're all like yelling, like, do you want to ring the bell? Go ring the bell. Like they're trying to motivate the person to quit like, or yelling at them to quit. Um, and he's just like, we just, we just don't do that. Like, we're not going to try to make you quit. We're not going to try to make you stay. It's just what you do. That's, that's what matters. Um, so the, um, so the, uh, the things that got people that did survive, that made it to the end, um, there were, there were a couple integrity violations. Like there was a guy who got caught walking the roads and was, so they called that a roadkill and he tried to lie about it. Like he tried mm -hmm. to hide the fact that it had been annotated on his score sheet. Um, there were people, there was a guy, you're, you're training the whole time with what we call rubber duck. It's a, okay. it's, it's a, 
uh, fake M4 rifle. It looks like it. It's weighted like it, but it's made out of plastic and, and, and iron, right? It's just there for dead weight and shape. Um, but you you're, you got to keep that with you on the Star Course. And there was a guy who lost his. You know, that's that was a, a pretty obvious one. Um, and there were some that in their board, basically, they said, like, you lack the maturity. Uh, like, there was one officer particularly, like, you lack the maturity for what we're looking for. Um, and then what was kind of tough for my, for the officers versus NCOs, for us, there's a very you know, uh, prescribed rates of officer manning in every organization or every branch and special forces being one of the smaller branches, it's pretty tightly controlled. So they had to call at the end of every class and say, how many can we take? Right. Cause we might've had some who qualified, but we can't take that many. So they'd have like an OML as you got closer to the bottom. Uh, it's like, okay, you're good enough. You're just not as good as this other guy. And we need these number of slots. So that's what got some of the officers. So long story short, uh, I think I did the math one time, uh, and I figured out that basically from dropping your packet, asking to go to selection, to putting on a beret and a tab several years later, it's about 12.5% for officers make it from that first step to the last step. So the the song, if you've heard it, 100 win will test today, but only three win the green beret. Yeah. It's a little bit yeah. of an exaggeration. We have a higher than 3% selection rate, but uh, but it's 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 still, you know, uh, it's still a harrying process or harrowing process. Yeah, and and so much can happen in that time too. Like you mm-hmm. said, just just happenstance, life, injury, whatever, right? Like I, I, it's, yeah. Well, it it it's it's heartening to to know that the 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 guys that do your job have to go, have to go through a crucible, as you met, referenced earlier. You know, you, you got to earn that tab, right? So that's mm-hmm. uh, anyway, that's interesting. Okay, now uh, let's go. Let's bring ourselves bring us back to where you were. Um, you're working your way up to Baghdad during the invasion of Iraq. Um, mm-hmm. You're hitting these smaller towns. And from there, you get it. Tell me about getting to Baghdad. So the, right before we get to Baghdad, we keep thinking, OK, we, we got brought in to do this mission. We're going to clear out these smaller places. We go all the way up to Diwania, sit there for a couple of days, turn that over to the Mar- yeah, to the Marines. Then we move out west. They're like, oh, there's, there's this, there are these towns out west called Ramadi and Fallujah that need to surrender. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, it's like the Iraqi army out there, they know the war's over, we're just taking their surrender and providing security in the towns. And um, that was actually one of the first incidents, um, I think it was Alpha Company, first or uh, first 325, the, there was a pro, you know, protest out in Fallujah that ended up getting Connecticut. Uh, they got took some fire from the crowd, they returned fire, and it became, to this day, there are people who believe that the 82nd was shooting protesters. Um, but it, it was it was like one of the first incidents of uh, complaints about the way that the, that the war was being conducted and where we were like, oh, maybe some of these people don't like us. Um, but we did that. So we stayed out in Ramadi and Fallujah and Hibania and all the, the, the kind of the eastern portions of Anbar um, for maybe, I think, about two weeks. And then we get relieved of that. We turn that over to the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment. Uh, and then we go to, wait. Yes, 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment. I was thinking whether it's 3rd or 2nd Cav. Uh, and then we uh, we go to this town called Iskandaria outside of Baghdad, and we're waiting there because we are waiting to hear what's going to happen. We all secretly believe we're going to go down to Kuwait and go home. All right, our job is done. We're, we are not part of the occupation force. Our division commander told us. We're, well, the division commander goes home, uh, but the brigade <laughs> stays behind. We relieve uh, a brigade of the 101st in southern Baghdad, and they go up to Mosul to rejoin the rest of their division. And we end up getting attached to initially 3rd Infantry Division and later 1st Armor Division to stay in Baghdad. Okay. For how long, we don't know. So... As you can imagine, there's not much of a role for an artillery battalion anymore. So they take the two firing batteries and kind of retool them as um, highway patrol almost. So they had a job for route security on Route Irish, the big IED route in, in right. southern Baghdad that goes from southern Baghdad, kind of hooks around and goes into the airport. Um, the field artillery battalion uh, becomes the catch-all for we call it the C- the CMOC, the Civil Military Operations Center, which was all the stuff that no one had told, nobody thought about 
that when you remove a police force and debathify all the civil servants, uh, we become the lead for all these functions. Like, how do we pump sewage? How do we get trash picked up? Mm -hmm. um, so my job becomes establishing and mentoring and dealing with the district council in Southern Baghdad. And uh, I've still got it around here somewhere, actually. I just found it. Uh, the uh, the Coalition Provisional Authority published this like book, the, the like the, the user's handbook for local governance or something <laughs> like that. And it was written by this reserve lieutenant colonel whose day job was, no kidding, uh, he was a city councilman. Like uh, he <laughs> ran some town in uh, in Colorado and he, he's like, I know how to do this. So I'll tell you guys what you need to figure out about all the functions of a city. And so like some tiny mountain town in Colorado was the blueprint for how was we were going to run Baghdad. And he's like, let me tell you how we do town town council meetings. And like, that's, that was the guideline for how we established, you know, the rules of how the district council meeting would run. And uh, it was funny because so at this time, you know, Saddam hasn't been captured. We debathified everyone who had any association with the Ba'ath Party. So most of the Sunnis, or at least most of the Sunni middle class and, um, and, the, and the bureaucrats, the people who could make you know, the generators work, uh, have been told you have no place in this government anymore. And the Shias, while they are grateful, they are also secretly believe Saddam, not secretly, uh, are, are worried Saddam's gonna come back. You Americans lose interest in stuff and you haven't yep. caught him yet. Yep. He's going to come back, and then he's going to he's going to punish us for this. Um, and I remember uh, there was this uh, this university professor who was I was trying to get him to step up. He was one of the more capable members of the district council. Um, and he, I was like, we come on, man, we need you to lead because all this is every week everybody just argues because they all have good ideas, but there's nobody prioritizing. Like we can't get consensus on. No kidding, what do we need? Rashid district to accomplish and I'm trying to get him to step up and 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 put his name in the hat to be the the district council I can't remember what we called it not president, but you know the chief executive of the district council and uh, And he looks at me and he says uh, You Americans told us to rise up in 91 and my father and my brother did and my brother got killed and You and this is what I, I found incredibly uh, telling like uh, we Americans don't realize our own history or even how our old history is perceived because I hold we're not guilty of this but he says you sold us out in 91 mm -hmm. you sold out the Czechs in 68 and the Hungarians in 56 mm -hmm. and I was like we can't, we can't be blamed for those but how many Americans even realize we are blamed for those um, and so I had that was the first time I had to start working on it sounds like canned lines but like how do I address this how do I, as a representative of a government that might have a dubious reputation and who's overtly known that we could tack back and forth wildly on foreign policy every four years? That's right. Uh, or even less, depending on you know who's who's in control of Congress. Like, how do I address this? And um, I, I I tried, and I, this this paid dividends for me later in the Q course because this is a scenario they put all the the captains in building rapport with the G chief. Why can the G chief trust you? Uh, when when you're this outsider who's trying to manipulate him or just use him for for U.S. ends, and this used to be something I said later in Iraq, and it was true, uh, but and I, and I used to say it for two reasons. So later, when I was back for my third fourth rotation to Iraq, when I was a, 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 a SF captain, um, I was able to say uh, I've spent more time in this country than I've spent with my sons. Right. Like I care. I keep coming back. Mm. And I, you know, I, I will tell you what my guidance is for my government right now, but I will tell you, I keep coming back. I keep losing friends here. This matters to me. Um, and I think that a lot of the things, and it played out, I'm sure we'll get to it, you know, in the collapse of Afghanistan, uh, those interpersonal bonds that existed between us and the Iraqis and the Afghans that we worked with, I think, those are stronger necessarily than the relative reputations of our governments. And, and I'm sure we'll talk about it later, but that's one of the things that drives me absolutely crazy is anybody who's always saying, oh, well, the Iraqis need to stand up and fight or the Afghans need to stand up and fight. And I'm like, these guys have been in the fight for years and they don't get a break. They don't go home like we do. Nope. You know, we nope. would rotate out and come back six months later. They didn't get that six month break. 
they were just in it and their families were in it. And, and, um, it's, it's, it's one thing to say, uh, it also drives me nuts and I didn't do your job, but it, it, it always, it always strikes me to that when, when you live in a place where, especially the, given the history of the Shia in that country, um, and to a certain extent, when he mentions 91, he has a point to the point, to the extent that, you know, we don't go home and then our entire neighborhood could get our water and our sewage and our electricity shut off in a vindictive way, much less uh, sarin gas or whatever. I, I had a, a Kurdish classmate up in, in, in grad school who, you know, just one day nonchalantly mentioned to me that seven members of his family were killed in one, during the gas attack by yeah, Saddam. Because, and, you know, so I, I always try to, when people blithely kind of just dismissively say, well, they didn't do this or the Afghans didn't. I was like, the Afghans lost 70,000 soldiers, you know, just in our fight, you know, and much less when the Soviets were there and then the inter- the, the, the fighting between the different tribes and, the, and, and all that. So anyway, just to follow on your point, I, it, it, I'm, that, that's frustrating because, you know, to, to a certain, it's made me really, our, 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 we'll, like you said, we'll get to that. But the Afghanistan thing has really made me kind of reassess and think about what our commitment is and how we are, how we're seen that way. Because like you said, every two years, much less every, every four, we're seen as changing. And those people have been fighting over there, like you said, and they don't get a break. So, um, and it really re- does, listening to you talk reminds me also that at the end of the day, uh, it really is still about the individual soldier and the individual that you're sitting across. That makes all the difference. And you're being asked at 25, 26 years old to be a diplomat, really, you know, and to be a politician on top of doing your job, you know? There was a uh, there was a, a passage in a book uh, about Isaac Brock. Isaac Brock was a, uh, a British general during the War of 1812 uh, that I always used to make uh, my captains read when I was a company commander. And it um, it talks so Tecumseh had been fighting the U.S. for a while, right, for his own reasons. And uh, apparently, several British generals had made overtures to him to try to get him to like be one of their proxies to mm-hmm. fight on behalf of the British and attack where they wanted him to attack to accomplish their mutual goals and he had always resisted he's like look i'm 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 not concerned with any of you guys right i'm fighting my own war and finally isaac brock built rapport with him and, and convinced him to fight along the side the british and uh they uh, apparently some of the other uh uh war chiefs asked tecumseh what it was that made it different and he said all the other british generals said here's money go kill americans and Isaac Brock said, here I am, let's go kill Americans together. Mm. Um, so, I was, you know, even if we have to be in it to a certain extent and th- we have different rules uh, about how close we can be to the contact based on political considerations. That was a real con- uh, deal with OIR, uh, Inherent Resolve, the fight against ISIS. But you have to, to a certain extent, have the street cred as I am someone who is willing to fight these wars. I have fought these wars. I keep coming back to these wars and I'm willing to fight alongside you. Um, and I think that there's a lot of belief we have uh, in our country as a whole and in some of the national security establishment in the idea of the ability to do over the horizon operations or, you know, what uh, one of my former commanders, Darcy Rogers, used to call it, random acts of touching. Like you're not building relationships. You just come in and like tag your partner. You're like, I'm here again every six months. Yep. Um, like it's it's just we're, we're going to lose influence if we think we can just – remotely come in every so often and, and either either for kinetic or non-kinetic influence mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah and I, and I and what keep what kept striking me when you uh when you were tell, talking about this initial experience in iraq is how valuable i i would guess that would come to be later on as you get into special forces which is, that is your remit man like in that in that is mm-hmm. is those interpersonal contacts and building rapport I mean, it's, and I, and the point about your sons is a really powerful one actually uh uh, and I've never heard it put that way before, but you know, you really, that's, it's a lot to ask for a 20 something guy <laughs> to represent his entire country, trying to get, a, you know, sometimes conflicting objectives done that make, make sense in your area of operation, but don't make any sense to, you know, and especially when you get into Afghanistan where these little villages and mountains, those people mm-hmm. barely even know what goes on, you know, 10 kilometers away, much less care, you know, they care about their village and how to, how to make that relevant. It really does it really does call on a lot of different disciplines in your mind. And you've got to be a lot of, wear a lot of hats. In other words, the other reason I tell that story is a little bit of, of 
cultural bonding, right? So at the time I had my big bushy Saddam mustache. I was trying <laughs> like, hey, Iraqi men grow mustaches. I've got my big mustache. And I was I was just sliding in there like, and that's right, I've got sons, right? Because, yep. you know, there's yep. there's that, there's a, right. a little bit of macho wasta. Wasta is an Arabic term for like kind of respect or um, you've got a, a certain amount of gravitas. And so you, there were certain ways to build wasta. And if you had sons, that was one thing. My daughter had not been born. <laughs> My my daughter was born when I was in grad school. After all this, but okay, um, okay, but uh, I mean, she's the feistiest of my kids. So she, she. Yeah, but I know that 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 view is you've produced some sons, so you've definitely right. uh, you've definitely you've carried on the line. So yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, okay, so uh, after that initial deployment, um, what? How long are you there total? Because you said you initially thought six weeks, and then all of a sudden it turned into a long time, right? So it's funny. Uh, I was we we were like okay. Uh, we've been here three months, so it's not going to be much longer. Okay, we've been here, whatever. And uh, we changed brigade commanders. Colonel Bray, our initial brigade commander, had to change command and leave. And we got uh, uh, Kurt Fuller, uh, became our brigade commander halfway through. At the same time, 3rd ID, 3rd Infantry Division had gone home. 1st Armored Division was now the division in Baghdad. General Sanchez had moved up to become 7th Corps, or uh, CJTF 7 commander. And then Brigadier General Martin Dempsey takes over as the division commander. So we're doing a, it's a brand new brigade commander, brand new division commander. Uh, Dempsey's going to come by and visit the brigade who's attached to him and, and do an inbrief. So uh, they need a, you know, some random staff officer to put together the briefing and then, you know, be the slide monkey. Who's like, you know, manipulating the slides, running the computer. So it's, it's, I'm just like the guy who, who didn't move fast enough when they look for a volunteer. Uh, so in the room, it's, uh, Colonel Fuller, the Brigade Sergeant Major, General Dempsey, and me. Uh, and this is just shy of the six-month mark. Now, at this time, there is nothing longer than a six-month deployment, right? Kosovo, Bosnia had been six months. Afghanistan was six months to this point. So we're all like, okay, we're getting itchy. We're getting, we're getting close. Um, I mean, I think we're like at, at five months by this point in time. So um, at the end of the briefing... Uh, you know, General Dempsey asks a couple of questions and he goes, all right, Kurt, what questions do you have for me? And Colonel Fuller goes, well, sir, I, I got to be honest. The boys are kind of wondering, when are we going home? And he says, OK, don't tell them yet, you know, because uh, it's not official, but it's going to be a year. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in the corner. I'm like, well, now I know. And everyone's about to know. Well, at least all my buddies. I was like, hey, we're going to be here for a year. Um so, and honestly, I think that might have been the best way to deal with it because by then we were at the halfway point. So we're like, okay, it's all downhill. Uh, I mean, it sucked, but I don't know how much worse it would have been knowing you were going to be gone for a year on the outset. Right. So right. Uh, I end up changing jobs while I'm there. So I, I, I'm still at the brigade, right? The brigade fire assistant fire support officer. And then they swap, like we do a whole change of command. Uh, outgoing battalion commander, uh, Steve Smith goes home. Uh, new battalion commander, Ed Reinford, shows up. Uh, we've got the same sergeant major, uh, Danny Musselwhite. Um, the the field grade officers switch out. We're like, uh, There's a wholesale change of, of a lot of the key leaders uh, about halfway through summer. So I rotate out to become the battalion fire support officer for 1st 325, mm -hmm. uh, working for a guy named Colonel Nance. And uh, so 1st Battalion is the one battalion. I mean, we're already attached to first armor division as a brigade and then one battalion is attached to a brigade from first armor division that's first battalion. so i go out to it's part of baghdad called Ghazalia in northwest baghdad uh and i'm the battalion fire support officer there for the uh basically september until we go home uh at the end of january of, of 2004. okay so okay. i come home oh sorry go ahead no no no. i was just saying so you you get home and then does is this when now Q course can go ahead. You, you're, that's when you, that portion of your career starts now, right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm like as quickly as possible. How fast can I clear? Cause I, so I, I get back in January and then I've, I'm starting, um, the, the infantry captain's career course at Fort Benning in March. And that's, that's a, a normal officer progression. All captains, basically at almost every rank, there's a course that teaches you how to do your job at that rank. Right. So it was the basic course teaches you how to be a specific branch officer as a lieutenant. Captain's career course teaches you how to be a company commander and a battalion staff officer. 
Uh, then you have ILE teaches you how to be a major, basically. It, it goes on from there. So before you can start the Q course, you have to get you know qualified as a captain. You have to go to the, the career course. And uh, for, at the time, Special Forces sent everybody to the Infantry Captain's Career Course at Fort Benning. Okay. So even though I was an artillery guy, even though I was going SF, I went to the infantry school. Uh, I go down there. I'm only down. They, this you know, weird change to the course happened while I was the first class that had this. So I was only down there for about four months. We graduated in four months. Normally it was a six month uh, PCS. So I moved from Fort ba Bragg to Fort Benning and then turn around and go right back to Fort Benning. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sorry, right back to Fort Bragg, excuse me, uh, to start the Q course. So I start the Q course. Uh, I, I'm signed into SWIC, but my course doesn't start until uh, SWIC is the Special Warfare Center in school. Right. Uh, it's the, the schoolhouse for special op Army Special Operations. Um, and and we, uh, we start in August, I think, uh, July or August. Either way, it's hot. Um, right. And one of the things that I, I mean, I've, I've always thought the, 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 the people I've known in the military are just this great slice of uh, America. Like every flavor of person that you never would have come across uh, in, in wherever you grew up and whatever communities you're a part of. Uh, you know, like I, there's one guy, Joel Bacure. He was my fire direction NCO. He was a Filipino immigrant and just this hilarious, like I think he was maybe 4'11". He was this tiny dude just with all this attitude and full of vim and vinegar. But he, uh, like, I never would have met this guy if I hadn't yeah. been in the Army, if we hadn't both yep. chose this path. Um, but yep. one of the things that, like, the first impression I got when I'm in, like, the holding company with all the other captains who are waiting to start the course is, like, holy crap, this is, like, a collection of incredible people, right? Right. Um, Well-informed, intelligent, funny, driven, you know, like, everybody is is that first cut, you know? So, um, I was just, like, impressed to be around, uh, in to be counted in the company with a lot of these guys. Um, so, the first thing we do is called small unit. Now, they've changed the order of this since, but when I went through, the first thing is called small unit tactics. It's basically just, you know, team level, squad level patrolling. You're doing recons, raids, ambushes over and over and over with linear danger areas and set up a patrol base and you're just getting smoked. You're just going to the woods, training the whole time. And almost nobody fails there, but there were some quitting. There was, there was plenty of quitting that took place there. And uh, you're always trying to like talk people out of quitting, not so much because, I mean, you don't know them very well yet, so it's not because you care that much. But because there's a certain amount of weight that the whole team's carrying, and if they quit, it gets distributed to you too. And you're like, oh, right. man, don't quit. <laughs> just wait two days until we go in. <laughs> two days. Uh, right. Then you can quit. But I don't want to carry the AT4. Um, <laughs> so uh, it, funny. So there was this guy, uh, Travis, uh, who I think he's still serving. So I don't want to. Uh, I think he's still a sergeant major. So Travis was my cavalry team sergeant, and he got mm -hmm. the unfortunate task of doing it very early in his SF career. So he was a he was a staff sergeant, and he was the one who was primarily training us. Uh, and one of the best instructors I've had in the army, like throughout the the uh, uh, any course I've been to. But one of the funny things is I later ended up uh, being his battalion XO yeah. and having to evaluate some of his plans that he was doing. <laughs> um, so it's funny how you know the positions change. Yeah, absolutely. But he uh, so small unit tactics about five weeks long, and you're all, you're all mixed. Like you've got NCOs, officers, all on the team. Uh, everybody's got to do leadership rotations because your your job, what you're being hired for is uh, everyone at a minimum has to be ready to basically command a company's worth of indigenous forces or up to that level, right? Because right. even the, the youngest sergeant on a team is expected to be able to maneuver 100 indigenous people. And that's, that's, who, that's the kind of guys we're hiring. Uh, so everybody, it wasn't like, Officers are just getting evaluated for leadership and NCOs are just getting evaluated for their tactical prowess. It was everybody's doing everything. Um, and then then when we come out of that, we break up into MOS phase. Right. So the on a, on a special forces team, you have various specialties so that the team can be self-sufficient operationally. Uh, the officers are all 18 alphas. That's just, you know, SF officer. You have a warrant officer who has come from being a special forces sergeant and, and has been selected to be a warrant officer. You have the team sergeant who's the, the senior NCO. 
And then uh, you have an Intel sergeant who also had to do something else first. We were going to do this, but you have two each of the core MOSs. The 18 Bravos are the weapon sergeants. 18 Charlies are the engineers. That's both construction and demolition. Um, the 18 Deltas are the medics, and the 18 Echoes are the communications sergeants. Um, so everybody breaks up into just these silos of those specialties for, I guess, about two months. Um, the officers learn all about uh, the, the special forces planning process, the types of missions we might get tasked to do. You go through several practical exercises where you plan those missions and then actually break up into teams and simulate them. We do some urban environment stuff, uh, some exposure to some of the things that we might do later, but just to familiarize us. And that's all about, like I said, uh, about two months long. Weapon sergeants learn all about like every gun in the country or in the world and, and what we might encounter downrange. The Charlies learn about blowing everything up with everything, how to make, you know, all kinds of cutting, cutting charges, uh, you know, um, breaching charges, anything that they might need to do. And, and keep in mind, uh, you know, we've done a lot of the, the global war on terror has kind of skewed a lot of our experience and a lot of the perceptions of us. So there's a lot of idea that an SF team is supposed to be doing this breaching a, a, uh, a building and doing direct action assault. You know, the 18 Charlies are primarily learning how to do sabotage, right? Because that's mm. what we're primarily supposed to do is help and train and fight alongside guerrillas. So they're learning how to blow up railroad tracks and how to take down uh, radio stations and, and anything else that, that might need to be sabotaged. Um, the medics, they have the longest time. So the medics you start with are not the medics you graduate with because they are in school for about a year and a half just okay. to learn how to do both trauma medicine and kind of exotic medicine because sometimes they're the, the only one keeping you healthy in these remote environments. Right. Um, and then the communication sergeants learn all about not only using all the radios, but non-standard communications, including Morse code and things like that. Okay. Um, okay. So everybody spends two months learning, except for the medics, learns how to do their jobs. Then we all come back together for what's called Robin Sage. Um, all right, I've heard that. Okay, yep. And that's that's the it's a five week phase, but the the exercise itself is about two weeks long, uh, where you go out to Western North Carolina in a simulated country called Pineland, and you do uh, you basically are helping guerrillas overthrow the occupying powers that have taken control of Northern Pineland. Um, and you know that's it's it's a great exercise. Uh, it's challenging. It's fun. Uh, it's the challenges are, are things that you won't necessarily think about. Like it, you got to figure out how you're eating. You know, you're you're not just humping in MREs or first sergeants to not coming by with hot chow. Uh, you got to figure out how you negotiate to get supplies. You got to figure out how you do it in a way that doesn't expose who you are or who your guerrillas are. You got to figure out how to communicate with your higher headquarters without exposing your guerrilla base. So. Uh, and then uh, when I went through, it was very weird. You finished Robin Sage, everyone who passed then graduated from the Q course. So you got your beret, but you didn't get your tab yet, which is weird. Um, and then you go into six months of language school. Uh, okay. These are all based on what group you're going to. So if you, um, uh, the, so all, all, our regional special Specialization is, is one of our primary uh, special, one of our uh, primary um, selling points, I guess, right? Yep. We, we are the yep. regional engagement arm of SOF. Yep. Uh, and so once so you knew you were going to fifth I, so already. I knew the officers found out, now they find out out of selection where okay. they're going. Uh, when I went through the officers, we found out in MOS phase uh, and I'll never forget the day I found out. So our company commander for MOS phase was a fifth grouper, a guy named John Burns. And he, uh, we were on a, an interagency trip up here to DC. We were visiting a lot of the partners we might work with downrange. So we saw state department, we saw uh, some of the intelligence community. We saw some of the, the joint staff. Um, and then, so every night at the hotel, uh, here in Arlington, we do like a little huddle in the conference room, like, hey, everybody remember, this is where we're going. This is the dress code for tomorrow. Don't be jackasses, that kind of stuff. Yep. And we're all down there for the evening huddle. And um, then Major Burns just starts reading off, uh, I think it was eight names. He just reads off six to eight names, something like that. And I'm one of them. And then at the end, he says, welcome to the Legion, which is mm, fifth groups. Which is name. fifth groups, yeah. So, and, yeah, there was, yeah. Was, uh, and, then he, and then he read off everybody else. And he's like, oh, yeah, here's the, where the rest of you guys are going. 
But I'll never forget that. Welcome to the Legion, and that because that's where I wanted to go. Yeah, because um, and, and for those that and for those that aren't familiar, uh, the special forces, as you say, are broken into regions. Your group fifth is Middle East, Horn of Africa. Is that correct? So it it when I went there, it was Middle East, and it was all of CENTCOM basically. Okay. okay. Um, but by then it had de facto become just the Middle East because Third Group was taking primacy in Afghanistan, although Third Group was still technically on the hook for Africa. Uh, so we've kind of returned to our, our, our regional buckets now. Uh, so it is first group does uh, Asia Pacific Rim. Uh, third group is Africa. Fifth group is the Middle East. Uh, seventh group is South America. And 10th group is Europe. And uh, uh, one of their battalions also does Central Asia. Okay. So um, so you learn a language associated with that uh, with that. Um, Region, like I said, I found out in MOS phase, the NCOs found out like in the days between Robin Sage and graduation. So they were, you know, next week I could be learning French or I could be learning, you know, Tagalog. I don't know. Right, Um, right, right. But I knew I knew before I went into Sage that I was going to fifth group and I was going to learn Farsi. Okay. Um, So when I we were, you know, obviously this was a rate of a time of high growth for special forces uh, yeah. to meet the demands of the, of the global war on terror. So the what was called at the time the SOAF and is now called the Bank Hall, named after Aaron Bank, old OSS and, and former 10th Group commander, um, the classrooms were packed. So we would do, you'd do a split where you would either be first shift or second shift and halfway through your course you'd shift. So we started, I think I went to the school, language school at two in the afternoon and I'd come home at like nine. Uh, and then I came into the second shift where you go to school at six in the morning and leave at one or something like that. Um, and that was the, that was, that was routine for, for six months. Uh, and then at the end of that, you go to seer school, survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. That's three weeks long. And then there was, it was funny because I, I got done at the end of seer. They drop us off in the parking lot of the, of the SOAF at like seven at night. And there, that's, there's no graduation. That's just. You're done. That's Show it. up at student That's company it. on Monday to get your orders. So I like sewed my tab on. I took it down to the sew shop, sewed my tab on myself and started out processing. OK. Um, OK. And what was your language portion uh, similar to how they structure DLI, where it's really comprehensive, seven, eight hours, that type of thing? Or I mean, it, it is intensive, but it is. Um, number one, well, you're supposed to tra- at the time you're supposed to train for the DLPT, uh, the, the, the the actual standardized test okay when i went through the farsi test had been compromised somebody got the answer key or cheated somehow and so there was no farsi dlpt so i took what was called a farsi opi uh, oral proficiency interview you basically get on a phone with a um language instructor at monterey and have a conversation with them and they'd oh, say I yeah i think this guy's about this good um but the other thing was uh the, the quality of the instructors varied. Uh, so we had three Farsi instructors who taught the three different classes. Uh, my instructor was a 24-year-old Iranian immigrant, uh, native speaker, obviously, really did his best. But the problem, like I didn't really understand Ameri- or I'm sorry, American grammar, English grammar until I learned German, right? right. It was the first time I'd put thought into why do we do this because I just, right. I just do it. Yeah. Um, and so he couldn't explain everything because he's like, what well, just, there's this thing called a raw, uh, mm-hmm. that if, if a subject is doing, performing a action on a direct object, the direct object gets the raw. So I hit you, it would actually be, I, you raw hit, right? So there's okay. just this R a sound that after you. And so the first time he puts it on the board, we're like, wait, well, what's that? And he goes, that's a raw. I'm like, well, why is it there? He goes, cause it needs to be there. But why does it need to be there? Because it sounds wrong if it's not there. He can't. Right. It, and it wasn't until like weeks later, seeing him do it, we're like, oh, I understand why it keeps coming up. So, the, but the idea is we're not supposed to be spies. We're not supposed to blend in. There are a lot of reasons I can't blend in as an Iranian, you know, yeah. and, and the fact that I'm half Norwegian is one of them. Um, <laughs> but also my language ability. But right. uh, the idea is that you can show up and at least communicate with your partners in an environment where you don't have interpreters, right? So uh, in, in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, when we were there, um, you know, in somewhat controlled environments where we had FOBs, we could have civilian interpreters or contract interpreters. 
Um, but one of our claims to fame, fifth group actually, when I was there last, we were proudest. We had the best language stats in the entire SF regiment. And we had, we post all these videos of guys training Iraqis and Jordanians in Arabic, right? Mm. That the, There was a real expectation that uh, you could at least be conversational in your language. It was not just a check the block requirement. Uh, so much so that our, our group commander uh, and Sergeant Major when I was there said, you know, if you are not language qualified, if you're not current on your language, if you're not demonstrated the proficiency that's expected, you will not go to any other schools, you will not go to any other additional mm. training, like we will not support it until you've got the appropriate language rating. So, um, and because of these, the expected regional expertise and your language skill, once you end up in a group, you tend to stay in that group, like oh, your right. whole career. Even if you go right. away, you'll come back to, to that group. That's the only group you usually serve in, right. uh, with a couple exceptions. And I like that each group then develops and has has cultivated over years its own culture, right? Like you can tell, you all go to the same selection, you all go to the same Q course, and then you see your buddies a couple of years later and you're like, I can tell you're a third grouper. I can tell you're a seventh right. grouper. Like you you just have that, that way of, right. of how you guys do business. Right. Um, but it's also kind of a closed loop system. So sometimes if there are bad habits, they stay bad. Yeah. Uh, or if there are grudges, those grudges endure for years. Mm, so. Interesting. Interesting. Um, okay. So, uh, once you're, once you're through where are your first orders cut to, where, where do you go from there? And then where, what's that, what's the trajectory of your career over the first few years of, of being in the team, in your team? So I, I show up at Campbell, Fort Campbell and, uh, excuse me. And, um, I, uh, the whole group is deployed. Mm -hmm. All right. The entire group is in Iraq at the time, all three battalions. Normally, Iraq was a was a two battalion. So the normal footprint for most of the war uh, of Iraqi freedom was two SF battalions and one SEAL team. That was kind of like the the what we call the Siege of Sotif, uh, Combined okay. Joint Special Operations Task Force. That was the composition. And so normally you do like two fifth group battalions and then the third fifth group battalion sitting out that rotation and then coming in and like so you, everyone would do about. It, it worked out to more than six months in the box because you had your transition time, but like seven months in Iraq, six months home, seven months in Iraq, 18 months home, seven months in Iraq, six months home, et, et cetera, ad nauseum. Um, and then every so often the National Guard groups or first group would like take a rotation to, to help, uh, you know, return some of the, the, the reset some of the op tempo for the fifth group and 10th group teams or battalions. So, but when I was there, it was like a high flex time. And so all three battalions were deployed. So Fort Campbell is a ghost town when I showed up. Mm. Um, I, w we know we're getting ready. There are three captains who show up with me from our course who are going to the same battalion. And we know we're getting ready to go in like, I don't know, uh, three weeks after we get there. We're going to go join the group. So they send us through this, uh, this abbreviated thing called New Operator Training Course, which it's not a standard thing, but it was, okay... You just showed up. We don't have time to send you to Cephalic, Special Forces Advanced Serving Combat, which is a long course. Um, but we're going to give you, like, the basic skills. So if nothing else, if you go straight to a team, you're not going to hurt yourself or someone else. I shot more ammunition that first week in fifth group than I had fought, shot my entire Army career up until that day. Uh, it was, I mean, and part of it was there were no other students for this committee. So they were just literally, we got so much ammo to blow, you're going to do everything <laughs> seven mags at every drill it was uh it was a, it was a lot of shooting um yeah, yeah but they got me up to at least a base level uh very quickly uh so that that finishes i grab my kit and i get on a c17 i'm sorry c5 still uh bound for uh bound for balad mm -hmm. i still don't know what i'm doing i just know i'm going to third battalion and neither do the other two captains so we show up at third battalion headquarters in taji and our battalion commander, uh, well, first we show up in Balad, we wake up in the morning, and the, the group ops sergeant major comes, gives like the welcome brief to everybody who just showed up, because it's not just us, there are a couple support guys, other Q course, recent Q course graduates, guys who are coming back from different, you know, emergency leave or whatever, and he tells us that uh, a third group guy who was attached to, to fifth group up north in Mosul named Tony Yost had been killed the night before, and what we later started calling an H-bid. And it was kind of a new technique at that time. 
where they would actually, instead of, you know, IEDs on the roadside or vehicle borne IEDs, you know, a car bomb, they would uh, start rigging houses that they knew we were going to go into. And so there'd be a, a tripwire or a, 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 the circuit would complete when you open the door. Uh, and that that's what had killed Tony. Yo. So it was, it was a it was a uh, sober reminder, like you guys are here and this is the real business we're in. Yep. Um, so we get sent from there down to Taji, uh, which is where third battalion headquarters is. And the battalion commander tells us like, great to have you on board. Uh, Q course has been doing such a good job producing everybody. All our teams are full. We don't need any team leader captains right now. So two of us are going to go be um, company XOs, executive officers. And one of us is going to be the battle captain, right? Which is tracking all the operations in the battalion. Um, and I got to be the unlucky one who got to be the battle captain. Now, okay. <laughs> in hindsight, I'm kind of grateful for that. Uh, we finished up the deployment. Uh, we did uh, the last four months of the deployment out there in those, those various roles. But what I got to see was the big picture of how what individual teams were doing were fitting into the battalion commander's uh, guidance, what he wanted to accomplish for the rotation. And, and I also got to see how they were resourced, how they were approved, uh, the, the different operations that they submit, and how their sit rep comments helped paint the picture of what the environment was that was going on in their in their uh, um, in their city because truly uh, the ability to communicate really matters uh, in in well it matters across the board but really when you are like a singleton entity out in the middle of I'm in Jalula you know Eastern Diala province and no one else is painting the picture of what's going on how you paint that picture and the words you pick matter not only for your ability to get things done but also to help tie together how this fits into the big picture of the war. Uh, and I saw, you know, based on how different sit reps were perceived and received and reacted to, like what was an effective style of communication as a team leader and what was not. And that mattered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we come back from that deployment in February of 06. Uh, so deployed in uh, what, November of 05, come back February of 06. Um, my second Christmas overseas uh, deployment. Uh, and then uh, I start transitioning to go be the team leader of 586, ODA 586. Now at the time, ODAs were designated with three numbers. The first digit was your group. The second digit told both your battalion and your company because there were only three fighting battalions in a, in a group at the time. So first, second, third company of first battalion, fourth, fifth, sixth companies being in second battalion and seventh, eighth, ninth companies being in third battalion. So the eight told everybody that my team was in Bravo company, third battalion. And then we we're team number six out of six teams. Uh, okay. I never knew what that, I never knew. I've seen those numbers, you know, triple nickel, whatever you see all these numbers. So triple nickel. And, and sometimes that last digit tells you something. So my ODA was what was called a rucksack team, which is just a line team, right? Okay. Uh, we were, uh, uh, but others have specific uh, focuses or foci, I guess, for um, uh, means of infiltration. So okay. uh, if a team ends in a four, that is a military freefall team. Okay. So free fall parachuting insertion is their specialty or for means of insertion. If a team ends in a, ends in a five, that's a scuba team. Oh, OK. So okay. Uh, and then less standard in terms of the number, because it varied even by company within fifth group. Um, uh, we also have a mountain infiltration team. Mm -hmm. And then some of the groups have, like, I know 10th group has, like, snowmobile teams that are experts in that stuff because they have a, a lot of Arctic environment or winter environments that they deal with. Uh, not so much for us. Um, <laughs> so uh, we've since gone to four digits because we added a fourth battalion uh, okay. to, to give additional capability to every group. So now you couldn't, that third digit or the second digit didn't work anymore. So now it's straight group battalion, company, team, and the four digits. So I, I spent a year on ODA 586 and a year on ODA 5326. Same team, two different ways of, of explaining what it is. Gotcha. Um, so gotcha. when I told you before that the, the teams were all full uh, when I showed up, that was actually uh, a, a, a lesser manned um, uh, battalion. So a, a two standard SF battalion has 18 teams. 
uh, three per uh, three companies with six teams per company. Um, in the lead up to the, the the GWAT, you know, special forces had been undermanned, right? There weren't enough people getting through the Q course, so they had mothballed certain teams. They just like they didn't exist anymore. There was still a place for them, but they just didn't have the people. So instead of manning short teams, they just would have five teams per company uh, in some cases. So five eight six got restood up. Uh, so it was me and, and our shift of guys who were either, uh, I, had, I had two of my teammates were my Q course classmates, uh, 118 Charlie and 118 Echo. Uh, and then others were coming from other teams that were, you know, rotating off to, to come fill out the team. So we stood up over the spring of 2006. And then by June of 2006, we were like, we we're manned and out uh, starting training. Um, we, at that time, so I, that was in that 18 month break then for my battalion between Iraq rotations. So we knew we weren't going back to Iraq for a while, but we picked up a mission to Jordan in, um, in uh, January of 2007. So this is what was called a JSET, which is a lot of the business of special, special forces teams. Um, it's training with and training uh, your indigenous partners and various regional partners in, in your region. So, um, you know, we do it in, in Jordan, in Egypt, in, in Lebanon, we, we would do these J-sets. Uh, Tenth Group does them, you know, in Norway. It's not only to train the partner, but it also gives you time to train in the environment, right? So we got to right. do some stuff. We'd take the trucks and go drive around the, the, the desert in um, in eastern Jordan to get used to the idea of, of how we would do open desert mobility. Um, we got to practice digging hide sites in, in the Jordanian desert to see how that would work. Um, and we also got to, you know, you are also supposed to culturally immerse yourself. So we went and saw, we ate in the local, uh, you know, restaurants of Azraq and talked to the local villagers and toured around parts of Oman, went to Jeresh, saw all the sites. So we were out there for about three months in Jordan uh, training with them. Um, and that was, that was I, I consider myself very lucky at that time to have been a team leader who got to do both a J-set and a combat rotation because uh, right. it was usually pretty rare. Yep. yep. Um, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I just was, uh, I, your, um, so your time uh, in, because 2000, that time period, that is just about surge time in Iraq? So just surge, before? Is, surge is just about to start, right? Okay. So okay. at this time, while we are uh, 1st Battalion and 3rd Battalion are back doing either training or J-sets during that 18 months off, so to speak, 5th yep. yep. um, Group headquarters is back over there with 2nd Battalion, 5th Group, uh, parts of Alpha Company 1st Battalion, which had kind of a specialty role, and um, a battalion of uh, 3rd Battalion, 20th Group, which is a National Guard Special Forces Battalion. So that was, things were ramping up and getting kinetic again, or I mean, they'd never stopped being kinetic, but they, you know, the, the surge was beginning. And in reality, so I'm a big, I don't like uh, a lot of people thinking about it in terms of the surge, because it puts the emphasis on more U.S. troops brought about peace and victory. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm a firm believer that more U.S. troops demonstrated commitment, right? There was... There, there was a lot of talk from a lot of our political leaders about just leaving, just walking away. Right. Uh, Senator remember. Harry Reid was was a was a he was like, oh, you know, it sucks to be them, but we got to leave. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so I think there were a lot of Sunnis who were sitting on the fence. They realized they may not be jihadis, they may not be you know radicals, but we had removed their protector. We had then kicked them out of government uh, or any role in the future. Now, they sat out the first parliamentary election in protest, so that made them even further out of power. So that was their problem. Um, but they they realized they had to make common cause with some bad actors to try to protect their own interests. And, right. you know, because they thought they were going to be left to the mercy of a Shia government that was out for retribution for revenge for all the bad things that had happened to them. That's right. And later we saw that with, uh, with Prime Minister Maliki that, Kind of was true. Um, yep. So we uh, so by performing the surge, so to speak, it showed them the Americans are not leaving this to chaos. Uh, or this, so we can make a separate peace with the coalition and work to to 
defeat some of the insurgents or the jihadis in our area. So that's what I think the, the awakening was really what kind of changed right. in 2007, 2008. Um, and it did actually started a little earlier in 2005 for time frame with what was called the Desert Protectors. Uh, the, the Abu Nimer tribe and some of the other tribes out in Anbar province that had finally gotten sick of AQI uh, and mm -hmm. it started rising up uh, that early. So it really was like we had a part of it, but it really was empowering local uh, local actors who already had power, right? Like le recognizing the pseudo legitimacy of these tribal warlords, for lack of a better way to put it, and in some cases, maybe organized criminal organizations yeah. to a certain extent. You know, they're yeah. smuggling organizations, some of them. But we had to recognize it wasn't that they were, they had those connections. Those organizations existed and they had a role to play in Iraqi society. And we just were willing to recognize them. And that brought them back into the fold. Um, so that was going, that was starting to go on while I was in Jordan. Uh, we came back from Jordan in March of 2007 and then in October of 2007, uh, we deployed again, the whole battalion, and my team was going out to Bakuba. Okay. Now, we had a unique mission. Um, so in the early days of the war, starting early on in the war, 5th Group had started creating what later became uh, the Iraqi Counterterrorism Service, right? CTS. Um, they were originally referred to as ISOF, the Iraqi Special Operations Forces, but CTS became the codified separate service from the Iraqi army. Um, and we were expanding it. So it had been centrally located. There was um, uh, there was the uh, there, there were kind of tier one CT force, and then there were the 36 commandos. And those were both located in Baghdad. And then they would like kind of deploy out to do operations. And they realized that there was virtue in having regional commando battalions that were dispersed around the four corners of Iraq. So I got tasked, my team got tasked to be the, the, the advisor team for the 8th Regional Commando Battalion that was being established in Bakuba. And they were going to be the Diala Iraqi CTS effort. So when we showed up, they didn't exist yet, though. They were still being trained in Area 4 in, uh, in Baghdad. They were still going through the, the, the academy, so to speak. They're SWIC. So while we were getting ready for that, we would do certain tasks to prepare for that. We'd go to Baghdad and meet with the, the teams that were um, uh, working with CTS headquarters. We'd meet with the training teams. We went up to Mosul, uh, which was where the 7th Regional Commando Battalion, the previous iteration of this, uh, this creation had been established, see what kind of problems they were running into that we could prepare for in advance. But we also recognized we were, we were sitting here, you know, during the middle of the surge um, with you know, an ODA that was fully capable and, and that our mission was not producing all of our bandwidth yet or was not requiring all of our bandwidth. So we found a couple local partners as well. We worked, uh, so there was a, our sister team, uh, uh, 5325, a dive team, uh, formerly 585, uh, was, had, was already in Bakuba. They had been like the, the team that was in Bakuba and would come back to Bakuba. They'd done like two, three rotations uh, in Bakuba already. So they had the, the relationships and the partnerships with like Bakuba City primarily. Um, so we started focusing more on the northwest Diyala province up along the banks of the Tigris and some of the, the Sunni uh, uh, rural areas. And then we also partnered with a Iraqi Shia police unit um, where we would try to use uh, them to target some of our, our, our Sunni targets. And we also dealt with um, mapping and trying to target the Shia insurgency within um, Bakuba. So 585 slash 5325 is primarily hitting Sunni targets and we're primarily hitting Shia targets in Bakuba. Now, the, the Shia problem was pretty complex at this time. Up until this point in time, Jaish al-Mahdi, right? Muqtada al-Sadr's organization had been the, yep. one of the primary sources of Shia insurgency. insurgency. They'd risen up in Nasiriyah or Najaf before. Um, and, and, but at this point in time, Sadr had called a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. Uh, he'd said, we're not attacking, uh, the, the coalition. We're just, you know, wink, wink, nod, nod, killing off Sunnis, uh, which is bad enough. But, and so JAM had broken off an organization called JAM Special Groups, JAM SG, who were still committed to the violence. And then it also created an organization called JAM Golden Groups to go target JAM Special Groups who weren't following Muqtada al-Sadr's orders. So there was a lot of uh, 
interesting human dynamics at play that we were, as we were developing networks to try to get certain information from uh, bad actors and use it to leverage against other bad actors. So it, it was uh, an incredibly complicated and challenging and really, in, I mean, I, I, this sounds morbid, but like enjoyable problem. Like it was a no, good no, time I, I, I was for just about to say tricks. This is I was going to say, yeah, it's right, first of all, right up your area of interest anyway, right? History major, you like the, you know, it, it's, it calls on all of those skills. Um, a few questions. A, are you seeing um, Al-Qaeda influence? Uh, or Obviously you are, but what are you seeing of Al-Qaeda? And also uh, with, the, with the Shia, uh, Iranian influence. Mm -hmm. And then from a, from a kind of a moral, ethical perspective from your own, as a person, what is what is what you're seeing in terms of good evil think how is that challenging your moral compass and and if it is at all and you know what's going through your mind right now because obviously al-qaeda and later isis you know and how that carries on to your experience in syria dealing with isis if, if that makes sense so going back to the first part so al-qaeda al the the al-qaeda we saw in iraq um so Obviously, AMZ, uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, yep. uh, had been in Iraq prior to, to the GWAT kicking off. He had run his own organization in there, uh, and unfortunately, I'm drawing a blank on what he called it before. I, uh, but So Al-Qaeda was really good. At, it, it was a, re a really interesting concept when it was really established, right? It was literally, we're going to be the experts in jihad to empower local jihadi organizations. Uh, and we will provide the advisors to help you fight the near enemy, right? Or, or I'm sorry, the, the the apostate regimes that were that they felt they needed to topple to establish a, a more pure version of Islam, right? Of, of you know of, of Salafist Islam, and they um, they kind of lost the bubble in in '96 and '97 when they released their declaration of war and their fatwa and said we're gonna we're gonna fight America, right? Uh, we're going to focus on the far enemy instead of the the apostate regimes, and that's uh, that's actually one of the like why ISIS was originally very effective. Is they focused on the original core task of uh, local jihadism, so to speak, and then they lost the bubble too. Um, but the um, so AMZ really after the war kicks off just reflags his organization and and we saw this as well with isis they basically just pledge loyalty i am part of this affiliated network mm -hmm. um so he wasn't necessarily getting direct orders but he was like i'm part of the global jihad i run the logo the the global jihad in iraq uh and i call it aqi so okay. that's there there were no kidding jihadists most of them were levantine grown right so they were yep. syrians and iraqis and yep. and uh, AMZ was a Jordanian, and actually, kind of a funny story. Um, so Abu Musab al Zarqa, right, or, or yep. Zarqawi, rather, he's, he's Zarqawi, from yeah. Zarqa, right, which is also where Jordanian Special Operations Headquarters is. So oh, really? we were able that. to, and and he died in Bakuba. So mm -hmm. in that, in 2007, I re-enlisted one of my um, uh, 18 brothers, one of my weapon sergeants, in Zarqa, where Zarqawi was uh, was born. And then we re-enlisted the other one in Bakuba where he was killed. Mm. Like, we kind of mm. did that. It was, you know, a little yeah. nod, pissing on his grave, so to speak. That's right. Um, That's right. But we, uh, he, he was killed right before we got over there, uh, maybe about five, five, six months before we got there, I think. Um, so at the time, AQI was largely on the ropes. Uh, there was a merger into ISI, right, Islamic State of Iraq, which later took on a larger role. Um, and then we had, uh, uh, shoot, what did we, JRTN, uh, Nakshabandia, which was another, that was, that was one of our primary, I, I would say we, we had two primary Sunni adversaries that we were looking at. We didn't have, ISI was largely focused across the river. We were, we were probably gonna have to deal with them. We thought we were going to Taji. Um, but we had, uh, basically half the Obedi tribe in, in uh, northwest Yala, half of them had joined the Sons of Iraq, and half of them uh, under a guy named Lodic left a Mashan. Lodic left a Mashan had stayed insurgents and okay. were kind of conducting their own local war up there. And then we had 
this organization called JRTN, Jai Shah Riala Tariq Nakshavandia, which was a Sunni nationalist organization. And they were kind of emerging and they were they were some pretty savvy actors. Um, this goes to your your question, though, about evil. All right. So uh, in December of 08, um, in this town called Sufate. So we had two primary sheiks that we were dealing with, trying to tribal leaders in this in northwest Diala, Sheikh Hamid and Sheikh Khalid. Uh, Sheikh Hamid had been a Republican Guard lieutenant colonel. He had fought us in the 91 war. He had been an insurgent leader uh, in the early days of the Iraq war. And he was completely honest about it. He's like, yep, I was fighting Americans because, you know, that's that's what I needed to do. Uh, and I had the utmost respect for him because he, he, he kind of uh, spoke like it was. And he wanted to fight these insurgents. And he kind of had to assume the mantle of the primary Obeidi war leader after his older brother had been assassinated by the branch of the tribe that had stayed insurgents. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, Sheikh, and they kind of had divided up uh, sway or influence or responsibility for the various villages up there. And this town Sufi, right on the banks of the Tigris, was under Sheikh Khalid, the other Sheikh's um, kind of zone of control. Uh, in late December of 07, uh, uh, Wadak left the Mashan's crew, comes in, decides to conduct a raid to try to take over, or not a raid, they, 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 well, they, they conduct an initial attack and then they come back and occupy Sufate. Among the other things they did there that day, they, um, they uh, killed a 14-year-old girl when they came into town, just murdered her. Uh, and then while they were in the town, uh, so th- these there are familial connections on both sides of this. So Wadik wants to punish his uh, his uncle, who is uh, affiliated with Sheikh uh, uh, Sheikh Khalid. So he sees his own mentally disabled cousin, right? And 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 mental disabilities are actually fairly common. Uh, uh, there there are a lot of birth disorders in, in Iraq. So he sees his own mentally disabled cousin. And calls him over, and he knows this guy, so he trusts him, and he walks over, and then he shoots him and kills him, mm. um, just to punish his uncle, uh, who wasn't there. So we drive up when we hear that this is has taken place, and we drive up to Sufate. Literally, there are buildings still in flames when we get there. Uh, the 14-year-old girl's father is like sobbing to me, crying about, you know, that he doesn't know what to do. Like he he's trying to do the right thing. Um, and it's, it was hor- like that level of evil. Like I understand fighting. I understand. I, well, a couple of days later, we go back up there because they've moved in now. They came back and we're occupying the town. So we go in with our militia to try to push them out and conduct this larger operation with some of the conventional infantry. And we get into a couple ticks, troops in contact, right? So a couple engagements with the, these are the same guys who were just doing this nefarious stuff a couple of days earlier. Um, in those, in the days following them doing the raid, like I'm furious at this level of evil and it's just so incomprehensible. I don't understand how one could do that. And then, but when they're shooting at me, I'm not really angry about it. Like I totally get it. Yeah. You believe one thing, I believe something else. I got, and you're willing to fight for it and that's cool. And you lost the coin toss. Uh, and, you know, but, but you, you know, you stood up for what you believed in and it didn't work out for you. Um, so I, I, I understand the willingness to, you know, enact violence on your fellow man, but not necessarily, you know, I, I don't I don't get the 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 willingness to harm those who are so defenseless just to inflict pain on others. Um, there were a couple other operations we went on. There was one we were cleaning out, clearing out a town uh, just east of Bakuba. I'm trying to remember the name of the town. But uh, it was like there were there were some deserted militia prisons that had been in there and there had obviously been some executions that had taken place in there. It was pretty, pretty morbid. Um, but uh, the unfortunate thing, uh, so Sheikh Hamid, the one who was worth a damn, uh, we start getting uh, collecting some intelligence that reveals that he is specifically being targeted for assassination, just like his brother. And we call him and warn him, and we're like, okay, we can't tell you how we know this, but but you need to lay low and not go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's like, okay, that's that's all well and good, but I'm like, you know, I'm I'm the sheik, I'm 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 in charge of like my 
my whole extended family and I have to provide and I have to like move supplies and I have to bring money to people. Uh, and so he was driving up to, to crit, uh, from, from Diala province and was ambushed on the side of the road and killed in the spring. Uh, and when I went to his, his funeral and seeing his little, his son, who was, I think about eight years old at the time, it was just, you know, there are Iraqi men who, and Afghan men, who are probably, you know, my age or a little younger, like their whole lives have been in, in some kind of violence. Um, and that, that little boy, I was like, his whole life has been at war and it's just going to continue. And now he doesn't have a dad. Um, about the same time, just speaking of kind of going off on a different tangent of bitterness, uh, about that same time in April of 08, uh, one of our sister teams who was way out in the East, they were kind of alone and unafraid without a larger coalition presence. Um, they got into a pretty big gunfight uh, doing a raid, and a friend of mine, Jason Brown, was killed. Uh, he was uh, one of the um, the weapons sergeants on that team. And uh, the team as a whole, like, overwhelmingly, I think all but two guys on that team received Purple Hearts on that rotation. They, they were all they had a fairly large IED strike, and then this big gunfight, and... and the the team leader is a guy that I think very highly of like holding that team together in those circumstances. He was, he was a really good leader. But when Jason was killed, I remember thinking, so you had a daughter who was pretty young at the time. And I remember being very bitter for a while uh, thinking there are kids in America who are going to grow up with their parents because their parents did not choose to do what Jason did. And this little girl will not have her father. And it was very unhealthy. Like I went through a period of time where I was like, you know, bitter and angry at my countrymen for something that, I, that you know, they sh I should not be. Um, and the idea that because people had normal walks of life and Jason was dead, that their kids shouldn't have not shouldn't. You know, I didn't want bad things to happen to anybody else, but I just I was angry at that concept. Yeah. And it took me a long time to get over it. Um, and it really didn't until we started, and in hindsight, this seems naive, but until 2009 or so when we were winning the war mm. uh, or when the war was really won. Um, and then that all went away and, you know, by 2014. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I, it's a, no, and I appreciate you sharing. I just, I, I'm just always curious, um, to ask people because, Obviously, not nearly the intensity and concept uh, that you'd experience it at, but just living and traveling overseas for the last 25 years in a lot of different places, you know, you come across things, cultural habits and different norms and things like that, that, that challenge your, challenge the way we are raised, you know, and mm -hmm. the norms that we accept. And so, um, and when it's in a situation of, of war or combat, it really brings that into sharp relief against something like Al Qaeda, ISIS or whatever. And so anyway, I just I've always asked people that have had your experience, kind of how you how you navigated that and and mentally how you kept it together and what brought you through that and and you've just answered that. So I just was that's why I asked that question. It's not to elicit, you know, war stories or anything like that. It's more kind of how you go through it personally and how you relate back to your family and and process all that. So I was just curious. Um, well, so oh, go ahead. There, there is something. There is something that I th I think there's something about the culture of the organization you're in too to how. To, to keep you grounded. And, we, and we've seen this play out a little bit and some potential warning signs or, or, or danger indicators about where this can go unchecked. I will tell you, in this environment where you are dealing with a, a group of people who have legitimate concerns, right? So the their whole way of life has been uprooted and torn apart and the people who did it can't give them straight answers for when their power is going to work or where they should take their, their wounded you know, a family member or whatever it is, right? But there is misunderstanding, there's frustration, there is limits in your own ability to even comprehend what they're trying to, to get across to you and your ability to fix it. And in this frustration, there will be a time that it happens to everyone and probably many times where you just, you walk back into your, your hooch and you say, you know what, screw these people, right? Yep. And if you're not around people who will remind you Hey man, that's just the head of a household trying to take care of his family. And yeah, he's a pain in the ass, but you'd be doing the same thing. Like if you're not around people like that, that bring you back in, uh, kind of bring you back into check, like it, it can rot away. 
Yeah. And um, I, I am, I am not saying anything bad about the other SF groups by any means. I just am very proud of the fact that fifth group culture does have. We were around people who were like, "You're going to do the right thing," right? Okay, right. and you need to remember this is our backyard. We're going to keep coming back to the Middle East, and you need to understand these people. Mm-hmm. So, um, that that's something that I think that you know we've seen it play out famously, I guess you know, or most famously, uh, the the Barrington report in in Australia. Uh, there are reports that the Brits are doing their own internal investigations, and we've had some high-profile cases of American soft, you know, being too feeling too empowered that the rules don't apply to them. And 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 it's important to remember you're not chosen, you're not selected because you're in an organization now where the rules don't apply. You're selected. Going back to that no feedback, you're selected to be in an ambiguous environment and come to the right answer and do the right thing when. It's not obvious, um, right. and sometimes when it, there are conflicting inputs, so um, that is something that you know we have to be wary. Exposure to evil can wear off, mm. or can rub off on you. Right, right. Be, be, beware when you look into the abyss. Right. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean. Exactly. Yeah. It looks yeah. back for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was just curious to get your impression, um, and to car- carry on with that cheery note. Um, Take me up to to uh, your experience because this is I'm really fascinated about this with uh, Syria and ISIS because at this point you're in a point of career where you're kind of taking all the lessons you've learned and now plan- in the planning phase of how to deal with mm-hmm. ISIS right in Syria yeah and there's so much going on in Syria um, you know politically you've got Russians you've got you know all this other stuff so can you talk a little bit about about that milieu and how you got thrown into it. So I'll, I'll give you, I'm going to start on a real bummer note with this, but okay. it's, I think it's, I'll, I'll set this, the picture for where, where we as a country were and where I was okay. uh, going into this. So in the summer of 2014, I was in, Af- I was on my second Afghanistan deployment. So I got to Afghanistan uh, in August of 2011. So just about the 10 year mark. And I remember thinking, oh, thank God I finally made it to Afghanistan because this war is almost over. Right. Mm. I, I didn't realize we were, we were at halftime. Um mm. So I got to so I got to Afghanistan. Uh, I went so I'm back in Afghanistan. 2014. I'm a what's called an AFD or a Special Forces Line Company commander. Um, okay. I've got two of my teams working for me. I've got a second battalion team working for me up in Mosul. Or I'm sorry, Mosul, wrong country. Sorry, Sharif, up north. <laughs> right. um, and then two of my other teams are detached from me, working uh, for a seventh group AOB outside Kandahar. And they have a unique mission. The reason their fifth group team is working there is it's a combined task force with American special operations and uh, a Middle Eastern country that contributed to special operations to fight in Afghanistan. So we're there, as, or my teams are there as their partners. Um, so we're doing operations. I'm focused on on my operations up north. Uh, it's very interesting and challenging. We're shutting down the war, right? 2014, the second time. It's it's totally. It's it's almost over. Uh, so we're shutting down things. We're kind of collapsing down our range of influence, uh, our medevac rings, where we have refueling capabilities. So it's up to me in this collapsing ring of influence to still be able to drive effects outside of that. Uh, so we're doing all these like operations where we'll like pick up helicopters, surgical teams, aviation, reopen an old camp, go do five days of expeditionary operations, like completely surprise the Taliban that we're even in town, and then go back to, to Mazari Sharif. Well, in the midst of this, I get a phone call in June of 2014 from the 7th Group Battalion Commander down in Kandahar. And he tells me that there has been uh, a, uh, a misdrop from a B-1 bomb, bomber that has killed two of the, the members of uh, ODA 5125. Mm. Um, so these are the two weapon sergeants on that team. Um, it also killed uh, uh, EOD tech two American infantrymen who were along and an Afghan uh, soldier. And so um, my sergeant major and I get on a plane and we fly down to Kandahar to meet the team and uh, stay for the memorial ceremony. And I remember thinking uh, on the plane down uh, from, from Missouri Sharif, like, and, and I felt selfish about thinking this. I, was like, I know a lot of Americans have given their lives for this country. Uh, I know a lot of people have given their lives for Iraq. 
uh, and I'd lost friends before, but this was at this, so this was my I deployed to Iraq four times by this point in time and Afghanistan twice. But this is the first time I ever lost anyone that I was their commander. First time I've lost anybody in my command. Uh, and so I remember thinking, this better be worth it, right? Mm. If my boys died, this better be worth it. Mm. Uh, you know, and like I said, I felt selfish because I was like, it's made it feel like the other lives, it was fine that others died, but because, because my soldiers died, that it had been worth something. I land... They take us, they pick us up, they bring us over to the battalion headquarters to wait for the team to arrive because they're flying in from their outstation. And uh, as we sit in the battalion headquarters, you know, the news is on and the news is reporting that Mosul has fallen to ISIS. Mm. Right. And I remember thinking that country was much further along and more stable when we left there than Afghanistan is now. It's There's no way this works out. Like, as a, in juxtaposed against why this better be worth it it's not going to work out because Iraq fell apart. Um, right, right. So I leave uh, Afghanistan in August, uh, and I, I clear fifth group and move down to what's called Special Operations Command Central. So every, the DOD is divided into several uh, glo- uh, geographic combatant commands, right? So every spot of the globe has some military headquarters that's responsible if we have to do operations there or for partnering with our regional allies there. Um, CENTCOM, Central Command, has Mm -hmm. the Middle East and Central Asia. Underneath that, there is a component command for every function. So the Army's got one, the Air Force has one, Navy has one, Marines, and then Special Operations has their own. And that's SOCCENT, Special Operations Mm -hmm. Command Central. Uh, And that's kind of a normal uh, rotation for a a post-group major. We end up going to a lot of the TSOCs or some of the other uh, headquarters that are like that. So I show up down there at SOCCENT, I sign in. Um, on the 15th of September, which is like the last day I could get there because I wanted to stay you know, through the Afghan deployment. I'm signing at the same time as my buddy Dave, who's coming from third group, who was one of my roommates when we were lieutenants in Kosovo. Mm. Uh, I was going back to that small world thing. That's right. And then I show up and I, and I say, hey, I'm here in the three shop. And kind of like my experience showing up as a lieutenant, they're like, we weren't expecting you for another month. Uh, so they're like, huh, well, we in the three shop we hadn't like planned a project for you yet, but we need to provide, by the way, the three shop is the operations shop as opposed okay. to the five shop, which is plans. Okay. And the way that Sox and headquarters had kind of delineated it was the plan shop was taking lead on Syria and the three shop was taking lead on Iraq, right? That was the crisis. Keep Baghdad from falling because that at that point in time, um, you know, there was a very real threat. This is when we were sent the like the SF lieutenant colonels out to do the assessment of is the Iraqi army going to hold Baghdad, yep, or, or fall. And uh, actually, you know, just to go back for a second, it's funny because when Mosul fell, they deployed I think Bravo Company Second Battalion Fifth Group to Iraq to just do the we're going to sit in the CTS headquarters and see assess the situation. And SF guys are so about chasing the shiny object. My guys are sitting here and they're like, oh man, Bravo Second Battalion's so lucky. I was like, are you kidding? There's one company in all of Fifth Group who's who's physically killing bad guys right now, and it's us in Afghanistan. Nobody else right. is doing it. Right. right. So, but that, that was the new shiny object. <laughs> That's the new, yeah, right, right. So, um, so, I, so they say, well, we need to send a three shop rep to this uh, Syria task force or the Syria planning group. I was like, okay, so I guess that's me. So I go to about a week of meetings where we're like meeting with the SOX or the CENTCOM staff, we're meeting with the interagency partners about what we're going to do about Syria. And we know that uh, General Nagata is going to uh, do this thing, you know, the, 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 the train and equip program is coming. Uh, and then they say, well, we're going to take this planning group, pick it up, move it to Qatar, and it's become the initial staff for uh, the, the headquarters that's going to run train and equip. So after being in uh, Tampa for about a month, uh, you know, having just come out of Afghanistan, I pick up and I go to the cutter to stand it up. And it was it was a pretty exciting time because it was like 25 people sitting in a room in Qatar being asked by lots of people in D.C. So so what are we going to do? Like, how are we fighting this war in in Syria? And um there were a lot of restrictions put on us that made that program destined for failure. It was not a, it was not a well-conceived plan. 
uh, from levels well above us. But General Nagata was the kind of guy who's going to do his best to try to make it work, right? Um, so we had this is this goes back to that that buddy of mine Mike that I met at, at OBC. So I am uh, the future operations director for this organization. Our subordinate headquarters is Fifth Group. Fifth Group's been tagged to do the, the actual program. They're going to be the ones actually training the Syrian rebels or the Syrian ISIS fighter. People who are going to fight ISIS. Mm -hmm. uh, we later called them the new Syrian force. So mm -hmm. that's what we refer to them as. And I'm on the phone with Mike. Uh, you know, he's over in Jordan at this time, and I'm in Qatar, and we're talking on a secure phone. And I say, it just seems like, you know, not too long ago that we were lieutenants at OBC and then the 82nd. And now you and I are figuring out, where, you know, how to, how to start a war in Syria. Like, they're trusting us to do this. Right. Um, and so I, went, I was there for about four months the first time, came home for about six weeks, and then went back over right about the time, right up until about the time we inserted the first group of new Syrian force back into Syria. Okay. Um, and then shortly thereafter, we had the tremendous, tremendously embarrassing testimony by then General Austin when he said, there are four rebels in Syria right now. Um, and the program kind of fell apart at that point in time and, and morphed into something else. It, it went to from the train and equip program using those partners to using those authorities to empower other partners who are more capable. Okay. And that's a and that's obviously a, a a function when you say failure. Did you know Syria has basically a, have been a closed society to especially to Westerners for a long time? So how was that a function of politics on our side when you say it failed, or also or a combination of that and also the fact that we just didn't have good intel in country? Or or what's your opinion on that? I th I think it kind of goes back to that like uh, at a national level. That thing I talked about where if you just can't understand the perspective of the person you're trying to communicate with, you're not going to get anything done. Uh, one of the biggest failures was insist. First of all, there was the there was a real um, sensitivity to any potential for American casualties at the beginning. So everything was going to be remote at a distance. Americans weren't going to be in harm's way. And that limited our ability to control a lot, right? Yep, uh, to, yep. to influence what was actually taking place. Uh, additionally, uh, the National Security Council at that time had a firm hand. So there was no delegation of authority, down, or not none, but there was little. So a lot of things were being very centrally controlled from the NSC, uh, which made decision making very slow. Yep. Uh, third, we had a problem. The Syrian civil war had been going on for four uh, well, almost four years by this point in time. So a lot of the viable partners who were, you know, not necessarily jihadists um, had been either killed off or absorbed into jihadist organizations. Uh -huh. There were a lot of people who were not jihadis who were uh, looking to fight Assad. And keep in mind, that was not our DOD mission. We were not a counter-Assad task force at all. Right. But th right. these viable organizations that were dying on the vine without any support. So they were willing to join more resource organizations, many of those being resourced by nefarious actors. Mm. Um, and then one of the biggest limiting factors was we put this prohibition on anyone who joined the new Syrian force. And some of them found out, didn't find out until they were in training in, in, in other countries. Uh, oh, by the way, if you sign on to this, you can never fight Assadist forces. They said, well, I'm signing up to fight anybody who's threatening my, my hometown, basically. That's right. And, I, That's right. I, and that sometimes is ISIS, and it sometimes is uh, Assad. And, and one of the things we, I don't think we really appreciated is for the average Syrian, the European refugee flows that were going out were not running away from ISIS. They were running away from Assad. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years ago... ISIS had killed. So ISIS, you know, horrible organization. I'm not trying to say. You no, know, no, it, I understand. It's like, you know, it's like that 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 uh, drill tweet. You know, I got it. I take it back. I but will not say you got to hand it to ISIS. Um, <laughs> no, but, but the new explaining. You're explaining the nuance, though. Yeah. Right. ISIS killed a lot of civilians in Iraq, yep. particularly yep. a lot of Moslawis. They 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 murdered people by the bushel in Mosul. Um, but. At one point in time, ISIS was believed to have killed anywhere between 10 and 20,000 civilian Syrian civilians 
At the same time, Assad had killed 400,000 Syrian civilians. So when you're the average Syrian Sunni, the threat to your life, limb, eyesight, well-being is coming from Assad and not, not and depending on where you live, but generally it's not coming from, uh, from the ISIS fighters. So a lot of these guys, they were, they were all about fighting ISIS, but not only fighting ISIS. You right. Know? And, and, right. And they, so that prohibition, they're, they're, that, that the problem, and actually this guy, Mike, uh, when we were in grad school, we had to write a paper. Uh, and it was, it was kind of a, just a fun thought experiment. It was like, what sport would you advise someone to play to prepare them for, um, uh, for conducting these kinds of irregular warfare operations? And his answer was polo, because you're riding a horse that is it, its own. You have to cooperate with this horse. This horse is an autonomous, you know, independent living being that has its own ideas. You have to try to coax it to do what you want, but it might not. Uh, and if you are not good at communicating with the horse, it'll do something else entirely. Um, so by f- wanting to feel that we could control everything from D.C., from the White House and the NSC, not make decisions in a timely manner and just expect people to do exactly what we wanted to do and not step outside the bounds all while doing this remotely from other countries and saying we're going to train you here and then send you over and best of luck to you and oh by the way we're not even sure we're going to provide fires we're not if you get into a contact american aircraft are likely not coming at this point in time so it was it was destined to failure for a lot of reasons now at the same time in kobani you have at the time the ypg slugging it out in an urban battle that lasted longer than Stalingrad, mm. you know, block to block, house to house, with their back up against the Turkish border, also waiting for them, you know, happy to take care of things that they cross over. That's right. um, and so they proved to be, you know, they, they had more grit to them. And so as they broke out of Kobani and started expanding, uh, we found, we, the United States, found that we could use some of the authorities that Congress had given us for the training and equip program to provide support to later reflag the SDF. Uh, the SDF, so the SDF was Kurdish border forces with a Syrian Arab coalition added to them. Um, and then as well, we had an organization called uh, Agwathir al um the MAT down in southern Syria that we also provided support to. And these these forces proved to be much more reliable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um... Golly. Okay. It's just, it's just, like I said, it's a complicated, it's, it's such a mix and there's so much more nuance when you get into, uh, forget Sunni Shia, but tribal affiliations. Right. So, um, mm-hmm. anyway, and then third party out, out, out of the state actors, whether it's Russians or the Iranians and us and all of that. So you're navigating a, 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 a hell of a minefield. And I just realized we haven't even got into Afghanistan. Um, but so, um, I wanted to ask a question about, uh, operational tempo or usage of special forces? Because obviously, once the GWAT started, the demand for your services went through the roof. Mm-hmm. And um, there has, I've read in certain places that I don't can't recall, but that, that op tempo kind of put a pressure on the special operations community that maybe, maybe not that it wasn't used to, nobody was used to it, they never experienced anything like that before, but what's your opinion on on that specifically? Did did we did we press our special forces maybe too much to the limit at times in terms of time for guys downrange, or, or what, what was your, what's your opinion on that? Well, so before the war started, there was a reputation that special forces were deployed a lot because they were doing those J sets, they were doing things yep. even if it wasn't combat, and that, you know, if, if, you wanted to, you know, if you went SF, your family life was going to be impacted, whereas the conventional forces, you'd go to NTC, but then you'd come home. During the war, that's that's not necessarily the case. We both had a very high op tempo during the first decade of the 2000s. It was just at a different pace. So like I said, we, Siege of Soda, um, the, the special, the SF battalions and the SEAL teams uh, tended to do, like I said, six to seven month deployments. Right. Um, and we do them more frequently. So you do, like I said, that six on, six off, six on, 18 off with maybe a J set in there, six on, six off, et cetera, ad nauseum. The conventional forces would do like year on, and then during the surge, those 15 month deployments, Yep. Uh, then like two years off, then year on. So it was, it was the same grind paced out. Now for some individual soldiers, 
those those year and year offs or the year on and years off that was that was a unit doing that an individual soldier might do that year then pcs to a new assignment be there for six months and then go do another year mm. um and and we it wasn't until later in the in the the war that we got good at tracking individual uh bog dwell time boots on the ground versus dwell at home time okay so um the the other thing to keep in mind is for me there were some natural breaks built in right i, I talked about like how officer manning is is done um we have certain times we have to go away uh to certain certain locations so uh a lot of my ncos like there's one my junior bravo on my team my junior weapon sergeant so between the two one of the of each of the core mos's is called the senior and one's the junior so the, the yeah. junior bravo on my team uh, that guy never left fifth group, right? So he was he was deploying as much as they were deploying, um, and uh, you know he, he's been he's been a busy guy until he got out of the army. Um, so I, I think a lot of our NCOs uh, had a lot higher op tempo, a lot more of a grind that probably took a, 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 a tear on them. Uh, when I was in, so I went to grad school as a means of doing um, ILE, the education for majors. Uh, and I went to a program run at Naval Postgraduate School that actually the Admiral Crystal had created when he was a, a young lieutenant commander in the Navy, mm. um, primarily for special operations. Uh, and so most of my cohort there were other SF guys. And I remember I met a, a neighborhood barbecue with another Mike. It's a you know, common name. Not not the one that I went to OBC with, who was right. also my grad school classmate, but another one. And uh, we're talking about we're hit, sitting here living in Monterey, California, getting paid to go to grad school and think great thoughts and write great papers and read books. Um, life can't get any better. And we're both saying we feel guilty about being there because both of our old battalions were deployed at the time. Mine was in Iraq and his was in Afghanistan. Um, and I don't think it would have had the same effect if it hadn't been um, uh, our, our specific battalions. But I, I do recognize that a change happened later or it might have happened at that point in time where there is this sense of, like my whole career, you know, with the exception of two years in peace at the beginning, and basically now, and you know, my ROTC career has been basically my transition from this has been focused on the the, the larger war, be that Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, it's the the GWAT, and uh, there's a I, I when I went. To, when I deployed to Baghdad for the last time in 2017 to 20, no, I'm sorry, 2016 to 2017, uh, you know, that was something that we were chasing those deployments if Soxent was deploying people out because you felt guilty if you weren't part of it, if you weren't doing mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. um, so there, uh, an SF NCO wrote an essay, I think maybe a year or two ago, and I, I can't remember his name, unfortunately, but a, a, I think it was called The Masks We Wear. Mm. And he said, you know, at the beginning of the war, he was his, you know, his kid's dad. He was who he was at home. And then when he'd deploy, he'd have to, like, get into the mindset of I'm here to potentially do violence and, you know, be switched on. And he said, as the war went on, he found that he became the person who was overseas and um, he would put on a, the mask of being the family man and the neighborhood dad when he'd go home. And he realized that he had become the other person and, and that I do think there is this, and it kind of goes back to that, that checking yourself as well. If, if that person you are overseas is just being influenced by the violence and the death, and you're not checking on how that's affecting you, not just becoming that, but if you're allowing yourself to go into some of the darker realms, uh, I, I, I do think that changes us. Um, I said something, I was asked to reflect on the, the 20 year anniversary of, of September 11th. And one of the things that I, I thought that has always stuck with me is Band of Brothers debuted two days before September 11th, right? And when we talk about Easy Company, and the last Easy Company veteran literally just died uh, within the last month, mm. um, that whole experience from D Day to surrender of, of Nazi Germany was less than a year. So that less than a year defined these men's lives. For whatever else they did in life, they were 
101st Paratrooper World War II veterans. That's what they were primarily. And I'm not sure that we understand how, and I'm not sure I understand it about myself yet, how when I get ready here in next month to stop being this thing that I have been my whole adult life, and before that, the only thing I wanted to be, and when that thing has been defined by the war, just going to, being in, coming back and preparing to go back to the war, um, I don't think a lot of us know how we deal with, I, I mean, it is profane, it's absurd to talk about missing the war, but right. you do miss the sense of purpose, you miss the sense of camaraderie, you miss having a mission. Um, mm. And I, I, I've i missed some of the weirdest things. I was watching uh, uh, Lawrence of Arabia at one point mm. in time, and it was before OIR kicked off, before we were back to Iraq. And I remember the scene in the big sandstorm, and I remember thinking, I miss the desert. Mm. Desert's miserable, and sandstorms are miserable. Shamals are miserable. But I missed having that experience, that shared experience that other people who've been there know what it's like to have that sand everywhere. Um, that's that's this common experience that that bonds us, whether we knew each other or not. We can always be like, oh, you remember that time that this happened to you or whatever. Um, and I'm not sure how we... I, I, I'm not sure that we know yet how much of an impact it had on all of us. That's a really good point. Uh, I've never had it put that way in terms of comparing uh, Easy Company with with GWAT veterans, right? And so, especially someone who had a, the bulk of his career in that 20-year time frame. So that's really interesting. And um, I think it really speaks to, to you say, missing weird, quote-unquote, weird things. I think, I think you really point to something deeper, uh, which is a sense of purpose, which, mm -hmm. you know, increasingly most of us in civilian life, because we are so affluent in America. And I think, you know, especially as I tra lived overseas and went visited a lot of places, I had less and less tolerance coming home for people to complain about the stuff that people complain about here, even though it's not their fault. They don't know, any, you know, I didn't know until I left, you know? So I think that when it's in the context of what you did for a living, uh, really really intense and 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 like you said that 20 years is is how do you define that 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 might be something that you have to learn on the fly because you've never been without it in your in your working mm -hmm. career you know so um yeah to be continued i guess right i just just curious to get your thoughts about that and then um of course i do i do want to ask about uh watching what happened last august in afghanistan and how we got out of there um i know what it you know, five of those five of those Marines are, four of them are for Southern California. One's from Sacramento, um, and I was going to go in the Marine Corps before I got hurt, and um, it still makes actually makes me furious when I think about it to recall it. So, but forget what I think. What were your impressions? And I, I go back to that that you sitting there in that in that I think it was a battalion command, and you're sitting there going, mm -hmm. if Iraq is falling apart. Afghanistan is way behind, and I, I that that triggered that thought for me because I want so I wanted to get your impressions of sitting there last August. Did you go back to that time and what your thoughts then? Like, uh, what? Tell me what you're thinking on that. So I um, I think the the U.S. failures in Afghanistan, uh, a lot of them were uh, kind of spelled out long before the 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 actual collapse. We we made some really now. There were a lot of problems with some of our Afghan counterparts, primarily in the in the political leadership. Uh, we never had a good, neither Ghani um, nor Karzai were good executive leaders. They were not good partners. Um, they were primarily, if not concerned, then if they were not focused on keeping their, their cronies uh, in, in a profitable situation, it was at least concern of theirs that they took plenty of time to make sure it happened because they, they look at it as coalition building, but it, it probably um, took away their focus from where it should have been. Um, and that's probably the most generous explanation of their behavior. Right. But the, um, I mean, we, though, made some really stupid decisions about how we tried to reform Afghanistan. Um, and some of it was a misunderstanding of the place itself, right? Like, so we all... Uh, the mic that I was at the barbecue where we both felt guilty about, uh, he said it, I think, best. Because at that point in time, I hadn't been to Afghanistan yet. So 
know, he was the third grouper. I was asking him all about Afghanistan. He was asking about Iraq, all nine yards. And he said, um, you know, we confuse democracy with legitimacy, right? Mm -hmm. There are, for most Afghans, it didn't need to be uh, fingers in purple ink. It didn't need to be one person, one vote. It just needed to be legitimate. And that might not be, you know, Taliban oppression, uh, but it just needs to be, okay, my, my jirga, my local council of elders have decided how the, the, the village as a whole is voting. And that kicks up to the, you know, the provincial guy. Uh, I mean, government uh, in Afghanistan probably naturally looks a lot more like something that we would consider feudalism than, you know, bureaucratic democracy. And we tried to make it that. We tried to force it that. And it was a misfit for the, for the environment. Um, we tried, that was a political decision. From a military decision, we took an, an army that only needed to fight and defeat, you know, uh, a local tribal militia, basically, at a national level in the Taliban, and tried to make it like us, an organization that exists to do expeditionary and very technical operations. How do you create a military that um, runs on American logistics and American supply and American maintenance when, you know, the overwhelming uh, population of your incoming recruits are illiterate? And that's it's just the way Afghan society is. There's not a requirement for it. So we're trying to build this system that's based on how our 18-year-old service members show up and transport, transport it over to there where it didn't work. Um, you know, we, we hindered, they're in a part of the country or part of the world rather where former Soviet equipment is very common. And for some reason, Afghan pilots were flying Blackhawks that they couldn't maintain and couldn't get parts for after we withdrew the logistics logistics for them. So there were plenty of structural problems, and I think many of them we, the United States, put on the Afghan government. The Afghan government itself, like I said, not being a very good partner, not not helping in any of that either. Uh, then leading up to it, we were so desperate uh, um, to get a deal with the Taliban that we basically just agreed to anything they demanded. And one of their demands was the Afghan government cannot be a part of these negotiations. So the Afghan government was sitting there just hearing the aftermath of what we'd agreed to with the Taliban uh, and having to deal with those considerations as we slowly but surely pulled the rug out from under them. Um, and then finally, like when we just left, um, the, the, the stories of the Afghan army's collapse uh, are somewhat true. I mean, it did, but it, it largely did because there were individual commanders who were like, okay, I'm out here. I'm not getting any more ammunition. I'm not getting more food. I don't know how I'm paying my soldiers. It looks like everyone around me is surrendering. What's Why lose everybody for this? Uh, right. And that's understandable. Uh, the commandos, uh, uh, our old partners, and, and specifically my partner when I was there was the 5th Special Operation Kandak, uh, those guys were real warriors, right? Afghan culture is a war fighting culture. So I always, I always, now in fairness, I never partnered with the conventional Afghan army and I've heard bad stories. I've heard they weren't as professional. Okay. Um, but the commandos and the Katehas, you know, you know, they were war fighters. Um, and many of them continued to fight after the collapse and many of them fought trying to prevent the collapse and, and, and were killed. Yeah. Um, the immediate aftermath, though, was rough for a lot of us. And I, I, I also, I felt bad saying that because I'm sitting here like, oh, woe is me. It's rough. I feel so sad about this. As Afghans I knew or worked with are literally getting rounded up. I was getting emails from people that either I'd worked with or that like sometimes it was a very tangential like, do you remember me? I worked for this other organization and we met once, but nobody's answering my emails. Can you get me out? I was getting random uh, DMs on Twitter, like, I am in this city. Do you know someone who can get me out? Like, I'm, no. I, 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 and it, it, there's no good, there, now, there was a, um, there was one afternoon where my former weapon sergeant, my senior weapon sergeant, who is my daughter's godfather, uh, called me and said, I have a former Afghan commando that 
is in Kabul, but needs to get to the airport and get out. So Danny knows the guy who's trying to get out. A friend of mine that I worked with at CENTCOM knows a former NDS Afghan who's able to smuggle people throughout the city. This is in the early days, before the Taliban had fully moved in. They just set up some checkpoints. Um, so I call him. Can you go? Can I put you in touch with these two guys? He gets picked up. Okay, you can get to the gate, but the British paras are running the gate. How do we get him in the gate? I call my British friend who was on the Syria task force with me, who happened to have gone to Sandhurst with the battalion commander who's running the gate. Hey, can you get in touch with your friend? Ask him to tell his gate OIC to let this guy in. Um, and it works out. And I, you know, you know, our lives go by in the blink of an eye in terms of geologic time. Most of us do not matter at all, quite frankly. You know, it's a depressing thought, but it's true. <laughs> and I think, what if all the things I think I did that were good? What if, what if uh, everything I think my purpose in life is, is not? What if my whole purpose in life was just to be at these points in time with these people throughout my career so that I knew them all so we could create one chain to get that Afghan family out? Like, what if the kid in that family cures cancer? Mm. And my whole purpose of being here is just to know these three people who I could make phone calls to. I don't know. So it, it, it was a period of like feeling like you were getting wins doing stuff like that. And I, 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 you know, had a full-time job and was working on my MBA. So I, I was nowhere near like that guy, Danny, I was talking about and some other people I knew, like, no kidding. They were doing 20 hours a day working to get people out. So I think that there were some people who took solace in knowing who they could get out or who they did help, uh, but knowing in comparison to those who could not. And, and, and for most of that, it was only people who were in Kabul. If you weren't in Kabul, there was no help unless you could get across the border to another country. Right. Um, but it's it's um, it's difficult thinking about that we did talk to these people and said, I care about your country and we're going to be here. And I mean, I understand the American people's or some of the American people's perspective that, hey, 20 years is enough. Uh, but it's hard thinking about if it wasn't worth it now, why was it not worth it? Or why wasn't it not worth it 10 years ago? Like, why did anyone else need to die after a certain point? Um, and it, it it sucks thinking that um, you know we 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 lost. Now the one thing I will and I I've gotten in arguments about this. Like people, a lot of people are like, oh well, we we haven't won a war in forever. Like we actually did accomplish what we set out to accomplish in Iraq. But just the original reason we said we were going to accomplish those things did not exist. Right. Uh, and that was a political and intelligence decision. But we did stabilize Iraq. We did it stupidly. We fought that war very stupidly as well until 2007. And then we took the victory that we achieved and pulled that away and then had to go back and win it again. But, I mean, we have, at, at great cost, reestablished a peaceful or a, a stable Iraq. Um, right. But we lost in Afghanistan and, and we lost a lot of people fighting and dying in Afghanistan. And it pisses me off when we think about there are certain decisions we make, you know, 2014, you know, New Year's Eve, 2014 into 2015, the war ended. And then we were doing um, Freedom Sentinel and we were just advising. But Rangers and SF guys were still dying. Right. Were, the special operations task forces were still getting ground down. Uh, Jessica Dinetti, I think, has a great book called Eagle Down, which is all about the special forces post-2014, like when the war was over and it wasn't for for third group or seventh yeah. group or tenth group. Yeah. Um. And uh, I mean, even I, I had an NCO in my own department. He was talking to our cadets. Uh, great, great NCO. I'm not talking bad about this guy, but he's talking to a bunch of cadets and he's talking about his some of his early experiences. He goes, "Of course, this was a different time. We were still at war then." And I had to pull him aside. I was like, "We are still at war." Right. Like and it literally just like had had a couple guys killed in Afghanistan the month before that. And I was like, it's there's still a fight going on. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's uh, I have to I have to temper my comments here. But like, of course, I, I 
there's a there's a time that political leaders need to make decisions about things, but how matters also, not just what. And the decision to shut down Afghanistan is one that our political leaders have the the, the leeway to make, but you shouldn't do anything like that on a on a short term. Yeah, obviously, uh, as as my grandmother used to say, it's all in the delivery how you say things, and to to put that to apply that to that, it's how how you do it. You know what I mean? Like you can make that decision, but how you do it is. Uh, is is that um and uh anyway i'll 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 keep going and asking you questions forever so you can i know we've been going for a while but i was just curious uh from a from a tactical perspective um first bit of afghanistan what was accomplished with basically a, a few odas and air support was pretty impressive um from what i've read anyway and um once we had it's seemingly towards the end of Afghanistan, what did we have? Twenty five hundred troops there, maybe mm-hmm. something like that, and air support, right? And for the most part, that country was relatively stable. Does that point going forward for us, whatever we may, you know, obviously, you know, conventional war that changes everything. But fighting wars going in the future, can we take lessons from the successes of? of special operations combined with air support in smaller teams before big army gets involved. Um, if that question makes sense. Well, I think that, and this kind of goes to what we talked about earlier about like over the horizon or belief in the, in the, the validity of over the horizon and just random acts of touching. Right. Um, I think our successes in OIR uh, in inherent resolve against ISIS may have skewed the perspective of a lot of people. Because, you know, we lost a handful of Americans throughout the course of that campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, but what we should not mistake is that the nature of war gets more technical, right? It speeds up. It brings in other domains, right? The electronic domain matters now when it did not, and the cyber domain, when they did not uh, for the guys of Easy Company. Yep. But um, the fight for Mosul uh, to retake it, like that was still a bloody grinding horrible fight it's just that the iraqi cts and iraqi police were doing it Mm. right so we believe we like to slap ourselves on the back and say well we beat isis with just a couple airstrikes and drones and some artillery well that's that's true but also at a cost of 60 percent casualties in the cts um and uh in, in the case of syria you know the sdf uh, so our, our partners were still doing the dirty business of closing with destroying sometimes, you know, in, in hand to hand range uh, with people that that were, you know, just a couple months earlier, butchering human beings just uh, to, to exact punishment. So I don't I don't and we're seeing it in, in Ukraine right now, too. Right. So we're giving them high Mars. We're giving them javelins. We're finding a way to enable our partners. And that is a, a valuable experience. I mean, that's the core of what. The regiment that I joined is supposed to do send a little bit of American support to create a whole lot of effects. Uh, but we should never mistake the fact that, you know, war is still going to involve a lot of dirty, dirty business. Mm-hmm. Um, and in, in the case of Mosul, it was the Iraqis. In the case of Raqqa, it was the SDF. In the case of uh, Ukraine right now, it's Ukrainian soldiers and, you know, the foreign volunteers who are still dying at a pretty great rate to, to, to protect their country. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think there's, I mean, the army's created this capability, the special, uh, or sorry, the security force assistance brigades to try to help codify these capabilities and use them to empower, like we partner with irregular and special operations forces. Like this is so the army can partner with conventional forces and the other in the regional partners. I think that's important because I think if a big fight does come, if we, you know, there, there are enough bad actors in the world who want to take a, a chip off of our influence around the yeah. globe. We might not be fighting in one theater. We may not be fighting in one, against one adversary. And so we need to be able to have partners in the area who can, you know, join our effort or be the primary force of our effort uh, as we maybe have a, a, a multi-theater conflict. Mm-hmm. So it's important to codify those lessons. It's important to think that these things can be used, but... Number one, someone's still dying. You know, someone is still, even in the victor's side, even in the, someone is still going to be fighting and dying for inches. Um, And then the other thing is we have to remember that um, every time we do this, the less 
con- the less risk we put to our forces, the less control we have to a certain extent. Right. Um, you know, the, 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 the best way to achieve a goal is to have your, your troops do it directly. Uh, but if you have the SDF, for example, when you're saying, I want you to go fight ISIS and Turkey's barking down their back door, those are real interests of theirs and concerns of theirs that they have to be, that they have to address. When, um, the Afghan, when we say to the Afghan military, you should fight, but we're not going to give you any means to do it, then they make their own decisions. Um, so this was, this was one of the primary reasons that the train and equip program failed because we wanted no risk to force, which lessened our level of control. Right. And that meant when they went across the border and came in contact with uh, with nefarious actors, they made their own decisions about what they were going to do with those weapons. Right, right. Um, okay, so to the extent that you can, because obviously you're still active duty, uh, can you talk a bit about your experiences with planning something, you know, like you did with, I- with ISIS in Syria and then apply it to now what's going on with Russia and Ukraine and what you've seen out of there. Um, cause obviously if I have this right, uh, didn't some people from your, from your air, your, uh, your group train, uh, some of their special operations for the last, since 2014. Do I have that right? So if there were training to take place, it would be 10th group would have done okay. that. Okay. Right. Right. Uh-huh. So they're the, they're the European group. Um, uh, a couple months ago, the first special forces command, uh, PAO, Public Affairs, Twitter account put out of what I thought was, a, it was right when the Ukrainians started punching the Russians in the nose pretty hard in okay. the first days. And they just posted a picture of uh, First Special Forces Command, we train with our partners, and it was Ukrainians all stacked up going <laughs> okay. through training. So okay. uh, I thought that was that was some good, like, you know, branding to, to yep. point out some sure. of our victories. And, and that's one of the things that I, like, uh, as I'm getting ready, moving out of my office, getting ready to change jobs, uh, one of the things I had framed up there, I have a, it's one frame, but it's the patches of Iraqi CTS and the Afghan commandos. Mm-hmm. Uh, we take pride in the in the successes of our partners, and we yeah. recognize that sometimes those successes are done with us right next to them, and sometimes it's in the Af- uh, you know, it breaks my heart that Afghanistan went the way it did, but I I took great pride watching the commando Candex. Uh, uh, go down swinging right like they yeah, they were yeah. give, they were given a fight till the end when mosul fell it was the regional commandos in mosul who held the line and, and largely died but they were the ones who were fighting for iraq and when it came time to retake mosul it was iraqi cts that retook mosul that retook ramadi that brought the fight uh to, to isis everywhere that held the line in beji so um I, i'm sure those 10th groupers uh who, who conducted that training are taking great pride and the successes that their Ukrainian friends are, are achieving. Yeah. Um, so I, I will say this. I think that we, one of the things we're really good at, you know, you, there's all, I'm sure you saw this conjecture uh, and it actually went around. It's, it's funny, funny in hindsight, where people were comparing Russian recruiting ads to ours. Yeah, and right. Saying, I saw that. Like, yeah, so, yeah. you know, the Russian recruiting ads are so macho and, and, right, and we're right. weak and, and, and PC. Right. Um, I mean, I, 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 I think we've got lethality in, in, in the bag. I think we are able to do shoot, move and communicate better than any other military. We can always improve. We should never sit on our laurels. But I'll tell you, uh, I think our, you know, maneuver and fires integration, nobody can touch us. Mm-hmm. Beyond that. What makes us amazing and we're seeing the Russians fail at right now, we can move stuff and we can move stuff all over the world and we can move it with rapidity. Uh, I mean, it it is true that we when we look at how quickly we turn to move people out of Afghanistan and move the 82nd and General Donahue out there to to run that like that. No other military could do that. No question. Um, question. I always told my cadets when they were getting ready to put in their branch choices, like, yes, the maneuver branches, that's what we think of, you know, and, 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 and that's some of, I mean, I wanted to be infantry. I wanted to be combat arms. I went into special operations, but I always tell people like, well, we remember third infantry division charging to Baghdad, moving further, faster, taking more terrain in the, than anyone in the history of warfare. While those tankers deserve all the credit, like for, for killing the, the Medina division, um, who won that war was American logisticians because nobody has moved water, fuel, and ammunition faster. 
we went, my battalion went black on ammunition, which means basically out of ammunition uh, in our first day and a half in Asamoa. And we got more rounds up there, 105 rounds up there to keep the fight going within hours. I have no idea how the log logisticians accomplished that feat. But, and that was, you know, 20 years ago we were doing that. So we're only better now. My, so my stepdad I, was in was in World War II, and he said he used to, he would say as we'd watch these things go, he says, you know, he, he was in you know Vietnam and Korea in, in, in different capacities, but he used to say that he said, you know, every you can teach a gorilla to shoot a gun, but what we do better is logistics. <laughs> he used to say that all the time. You know what I mean? It's it's uh, that's funny you say that. I just it, it, I hear my stepdad's voice saying logistics, logistics. You know, I I, I remember uh, the um, uh, I think it was. At one point in time, when there was the baby formula shortage going on, right, we were sending C seventeens. It was, you, you, if you've ever seen seventeen seventy six, you know the the, I mean, it's a sad part of our American history, but you know the molasses to rum to slaves, right? Yeah. The, the trade circle. Um, yep. we would, we were running. We were like, going, dropping off guns, <laughs> javelins to the Ukrainians flying up to somewhere else in Europe to pick up baby formula, bringing it back, dropping off, picking up guns, going out to Ukraine. Like the fact that we're like, we got two problems and we got a bunch of C-17s, let's make it work. Um, you know, the military is incredibly adaptive. And one of the things I love working, like the vast majority of people are like, you know, this isn't what I signed up for. I wasn't planning to move baby formula out of Europe, but I'm going to figure it out. Yeah. Uh, this is the task we've got. So I think we have the ability to plan some complex stuff. We have the ability to react to, to what we want to. Where I think we fail right now as a country, um, we don't have a grand strategy. We don't really have a, what do we want the world to look like? What do we want to do to change what is not right? And what do we want to do to preserve what we think is right? So what we find ourselves doing is reacting on the fly to things like the Syrian civil war, like the crisis in Ukraine, um, and that's fine, but, uh, you know, we can only be adaptive so long. And one of the things that I'm trying to remember who said this, uh, but, but it's stolen. It's a stolen thought, but they said one of the problems we have, and we talked about it before with like the, the, the four year cycles of potentially changing, um, yeah, leadership. Uh, changing foreign policy. Yep. Whenever Americans do foreign policy, it has to comply or comport with, American values, or at least we have to believe that it does, right? We have to we have to believe this is virtuous, even if we're mistaken. Yep, um, yep. And this person, whoever it was that I wish I could attribute the quote to, said, "The Russians and Chinese don't have this problem. They don't have Russian v values. They just have Russian interests." Uh, and and so we're competing against people who, like I said, I'm not going to say that they're they're not better militaries, but they might be more adaptive because they can just act on a on out of self-interest and with an aligned sense of purpose as opposed to, you know, what makes democracy great, but that's sometimes makes us also inefficient. Yeah. And long-term that's the big, that's the big debate, right? Uh, you know, because you, every so often when I'd lived in China, I would, you know, people would, I'd hear expats say, wow, man, they just, you know, 20, 20 years ago, Shenzhen, where I live, for example, it was a fishing village in a swamp across from Hong Kong. And now it's this 30 million, 30 million person metropolis, right? And mm -hmm. it's the infrastructure is great and all that. And I said, yeah, that's true. Uh, but they also had to displace a couple million people in two months. And there was no imminent domain. There was no, you know, there was no court here. And so I'm not to say which is better. It's just kind of for certain tasks, long term, what is the better system? And I think that's a constant generational thing we as, as citizens, because I still think as a military, you're your job is a reflection of us at the end of the day, you know what I mean? And, and our political values. And so, um, yeah, that's a, that's a big question because there are certain, you know, authoritarian states can do things quickly at certain times. And as you say, their interests, the interests of the people that make those decisions don't have to be al aligned with the, the guy, the average guy who's an accountant or a truck driver, you know, it just, uh, anyway, I think that, uh, that, that's that, that's that question. I don't think ever be answered definitively, I think it's every generation you have to figure that out as it goes. But I think your point about a grand strategy is a really important one because I, it feels that way in my bones right now that we lack that. Uh, I, I mean, and I, I think that to a certain extent in 1991 we became the dog who caught the car, right? Yeah. So for 
from 1945 until 1991, while well, there were different iterations of it, right? Containment, detente, and then, yep. you know, resolution, uh, you know, but generally we agreed we oppose the Soviet Union and we will compete on the fringes of these spheres of influence to try to take away from what they have and keep what we've got. Um, and then, then all of a sudden, you know, it was Fukuyama and the end of history and right, right. We didn't really know then, you know, that world order was falling apart. So we were shepherding in the new one through Balk Balkan peacekeeping. Uh, and then September 11th happened and we just haven't thought about it. It's just been reactive yeah, uh, yeah. or focused on the things that we, we were doing while the rest of the world was shaping around us. And uh, I think there are there are a couple of people who, you know, uh, Neil Ferguson and, and uh, yep. uh, BHL will, will yep. say like, you know, the world's a better place when America exerts its influence for good. And uh, we, you know, we can look at our mistakes. We can look at the errors we've made. We can look at the sins we've committed. You know, we, we should not be shy about saying that sometimes we have act for the causes of wrong um, more domestically than foreign. But generally speaking, we're a force for good. Yeah. And sometimes greater evil comes from our absence than us exerting our influence and i'd say more often than not had a had a former guest from your uh from from your community say this make the exact same point it's like an absence of what i lived over in asia the 70 80 percent of the world's goods go through the straits of malacca so mm -hmm. and who patrols who ensures that those are goes through securely we do <laughs> and yep. when that goes away who feels you know the vacuum is going to be filled and it'll be by china over there and maybe by Russia somewhere else and by people who not only don't have our interest in mind, but don't have an interest from the free flow of goods full stop, as we're seeing with, right. you know, wheat and oil in Russia and Ukraine right now. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's an important point. Um, all right. I, I, I could keep talking to you all night long. I don't want to be too, too disrespectful for your time, but I really appreciate all, all of this. Cause this is right up my alley. I'm really curious. Um, kind of a final question, I guess, uh, Looking back on your career as you're about to separate now and start that process, um, what are you know we all have regrets, but is there anything that sticks out that you wish maybe you had reached that fork in the road and taken a different path? And then also, what are you most proud of, uh, of uh, in your time? Who you know as in 23 years? So I I don't think it's one particular regret. Uh, I think every every deployment you come back, you're pretty exhausted. You're pretty tired. You're pretty strung out all the time. Uh, I mean, some to a greater extent than others. Some of my deployments were not as stressful as others. Um, but every time I come back and I think about the the one more thing I could have done or should have done, right? And um, from my my team leader time, like I was talking about, Wadak left him a Sean. He's one of two guys. There was one Sunni and one Shia that were on our target list that we had developed. There were two. We got everybody we went after except for those two guys. And I really wish we'd gotten both of them. And you know what? It probably wouldn't have made a difference. There were plenty of knuckleheads and, and malign actors all over Iraq. And those guys doing their evil wasn't going to change anything. But the fact that I got to see their evil up front, like I, I really wanted to get them. Um when um, Scott and Jason, my two soldiers who were killed in 2014 were killed, uh, I thought a lot about whether I had done enough to make sure that team was trained and ready to go. Um, I, uh, for some reason, you know, like I said with Jason, it's the connection to children that, that makes it so hard sometimes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember the night they they deployed. They they left about two weeks before the company headquarters to go get out to to Kandahar, um, and uh, Jason's wife was also a soldier uh, assigned to fifth group, and she was there. All the families were there, like in their team room, to see them off. And the, my company sergeant major and I went up and sit to greet the families and see the team off. And I, I talked to the families. And uh, I gave them the, you know, the speech that what the team was doing was important, that it mattered, they were trained and ready, and they were going to, you know, that, that you know, they were ready for the mission at hand. And uh, Jason's wife was there, and she was there with their two daughters. Mm -hmm. And I feel, uh, I, I 
feel an incredible sense of guilt about having said that. Hmm. And I meant it, and I meant it sincerely. But the fact is for her and for her daughters, that did not bear out. Hmm. Um, uh, Scott wasn't married. Uh, I never met his parents, uh, but I'm sure I'd feel similarly if they had been in the room. Right. Um, but... As far as pride goes, um, it's it's difficult sometimes to look at Iraq and Afghanistan, and like, you know to to put it in the in the, the easy the easier war to, to comprehend I guess you know the guys from Easy Company were fighting organized profound tangible evil right. and they won and they yeah. ended it. Um, it's hard to wonder if, you know, what you did paid off. But if I look at, you know, the span of human history, uh, evil is always going to creep in. Evil's it's the tide and you can only push it back so far. Uh, so I can take pride knowing that, uh, I led operations, I conducted operations, I was part of organizations that at least push back on it and at least bought time for some of the people in those countries. And I don't know if that's enough, but I know that someone was alive for at least another couple of years longer than they would have been had we not done what we did. And people who deserved not to be alive are no longer on this earth because of what we did. Um, and I, I take, I take pride in when I see when I see the capacity of evil from the people we were fighting, knowing that we removed so many of them from this earth. Um, and quite frankly, I am, I grew up, uh, kind of a, kind of a, a, a weird military history kid. Like I was always fascinated by the army. I always wanted to be in the army. Um, and I grew up reading about these units that I ended up serving. In. When my brother and I were little, we went to the surplus store and, and when my dad got tired of us playing in his uniforms, uh, we bought two like old BDU jackets and we got patches and we sewed them on. And the two we picked that we wanted to play, pretend we were part of, were the 82nd Airborne Division and Special Forces patch. And I, I got to literally grow up and be the thing that I pretended I wanted, I was being. Um, That's and, rare, man. And it was, it was crazy when I got to group the fir for the, the first couple of years. I had read books and articles about what had happened in Afghanistan. And then I, I find out I'm in the same battalion with some of these guys. Yeah. Like you're a legend. I've read about you. I know who you are. Uh, and I, I, I truly like, I, I think my accomplishments and my career, uh, tiny compared to what some of the guys in group have done. Yeah. Uh, I am proud to have been a part of that organization. Uh, more than than like anything I did, you know. I, I'm I'm very proud of the the lineage and the tradition and the history and the people I served within that organization. Uh, and I will always think of myself first and foremost as a fifth grouper, you know, like uh, more than anything else. Uh, okay, and to wrap up, um, looking forward into the future, you've had uh, you've had experience in the army, leading you know from the policy planning stage. Um, and then obviously execution earlier in your career in terms of on the ground. Um, as, you, as you kind of end your career um, and looking forward, what do we as a country, in your opinion, need to do, A, with the Army specifically to kind of, I don't, maybe modernize is not the right word, but to be prepared for what's on the horizon um, for, for potential military, military challenges for us as a country, and then the military as a whole. Um, what, do, what are your opinion on, on those two issues? Well, uh, I'm reminded of something that General Milley said a couple of years ago uh, when he was still Chief of Staff of the Army before he became the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, and I don't remember what form he was speaking at, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said something like, uh, how do you deal with the problem of an army of humans that need to sleep and rest and, and refit themselves uh, when in the future you won't be able to hold still for more than four hours before you're detected, right? Before sensors are going to get so good, automated sensors particularly, that within four hours of stopping, you will be detected. And then in a theory, integration of uh, indirect fires will be so good that you'll be, you know, you'll have effects driven uh, on you if you're holding still for that long. 
So how do you deal with a human body that needs an eight-hour sleep cycle and can function with less for limited periods of time, but you know, not much less than six on a regular basis for, for weeks at a time when you can't, uh, when you can't hold still? And that, that, that idea, I thought, was a real challenge. Uh, I think what we're seeing right now play out with uh, the, the Russians' difficulties is that even if you get better at sensors, um, and, and they're, not, they're not as good as we are, and they're not, probably not as good as the Chinese are, but even if you get better sensors, you still need the human integration of all of these functions. You need to be able to process and synergize all this information. Um, we used to have a system, uh, and it's a, it's a great system, I'm not trying to knock it, but called Palantir. Going back probably about, you know, I don't know, 15 years now, we've had it or integrated it into some of our operations. And the problem with Palantir is that it can rip so much data and pro or provide you so much data, but there's not the opportunity for a human mind to keep up with that much data and provide context or, or synthesize it. So I think the problem we might see is some of our less uh, uh, morally concerned adversaries might, to try to defeat this problem of synchronization, turn over the decision to more automation. And this is a problem that Peter Singer, uh, who used to be at Brookings, I don't know if he still is, mm -hmm. But he, th he thinks a lot about um, kind of the automation of warfare and uh, the integration of AI. And I heard him speak, oh, I don't know, uh, about 11 years ago, maybe 12 years ago at Naval Postgraduate School. And he said, uh, you know, we have right now machines that can detect and machines that can kill, but the decision to kill is still being given to a human. Mm -hmm. So what happens when our Chinese or Russian adversaries decide to get inside our OODA loop, to get inside our decision cycle and be faster at these things, that they turn over that decision to an automated system. Um, so I think being able to be ready to meet those challenges, be ready to integrate systems that allow us to still have the decision but act in a, in a quick manner. Uh, as our sensors get better, how do we integrate our, our shooters uh, that, that can deliver effects in a timely manner while still making the decisions about how those, those effects get used? getting into Terminator territory at some point, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, right. where, the, where, where AI makes the, the most, uh, yeah, you, that the morality issue and ethics is, is, a, is a key one with, with AI and machine learning. That's well, not, not even, yeah, not even necessarily like the sci-fi machines versus humans thing, but, you know, machines only as good as the garbage you put into it, right? So right. if you give these certain parameters of look for an object that is roughly this tall, that has roughly this heat signature, that's roughly in this area that might be carrying something that looks roughly like a stick, right? So you might have programmed it to think that you're going to target a military age male who's in an area that you think is full of adversaries that is carrying a weapon, but in fact that you know that leads to any number of, of unknown outcomes that that machine is just operating on the parameters that it's been given. Right, right, right. Because that could just be an innocent guy hurting his goats. You don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and that that leads, of course, to a whole series of other questions. But that but but uh, down that road. But that's a that's an interesting, uh, like you, I've listened to a few, few speakers and podcasts on that, uh, on that issue. And, you know, again, it, it, also the way technology changes and adapts and innovates, you know, who knows how, <laughs> if it's even four hours in the future, maybe it's 30, 30 minutes we get to, you know, you sit in a place and, right. you know, who knows, right? So then, then, then what do we get? Um, okay. And I, like I said, I, I really appreciate all your time. Um, I could, go on asking you questions for the next another three, four hours, but I uh, don't want to take up that, that much of your time. Um, is there any, uh, do, do you know what what's next for you? Because you're just about to get out and catching you right at the tail end of your career. Um, you've had a really wide uh, experience in the Army, so I'm assuming there's a lot of avenues you're teaching. Um, what do you, do you enjoy the professor thing? Do you want to do something totally different? You want to go walk, uh, do Qui-Gon Cain and walk the earth by yourself for a while? <laughs> what's next for you, man? So uh, this, this assignment is my final assignment, being a professor of military science. Uh, I look at it's a really good way to, to leave this organization that I've loved for so long. And honestly, since as long as I can remember, the only thing I ever wanted to do. Uh, and the reason is, number one, I get to be, uh, you know, every day I was sitting, in, you know, exposed to the, the cadets, the future leaders of the U.S. Army who were, you know, hungry to learn, who were, couldn't wait. You know, I, I, I was reminded of my... 19 year old self just like asking all these questions waiting, you know impatient to get out to the force uh, And that's them now and it makes it a lot easier to leave knowing I know exactly who I'm turning it over to and it's in, in pretty good hands 
um, you know, they're like me, you know, young lieutenants or, you know, when they graduate, young lieutenants who uh, have a lot to learn. Uh, but the, the baseline of, I, you know, I want to do the right thing and I want to lead my soldiers appropriately and I want to learn from uh, my peers and my mentors and learn what the NCOs who I'm going to go to that first unit are going to teach me. Uh, I remember my first assignment, uh, there are guys that, you know, uh, Sergeant Mike Nichols and, and uh, Gunny Glover, uh, Sergeant Bustos, these guys, some of them, uh, Sergeant Vince Knoll, these guys took uh, a young lieutenant and would pull me aside and say, hey, sir, you're kind of screwed up right now. Let me see your rucksack, you know, before airborne operations, because, you know, like the, the one I mentioned, Mike Nichols, that guy was a jump master's jump master. And when I think of how I wanted to be as a jump master, I think of him. Uh, and he and uh, Smoke Glover were just, um, you know, proficient, professional artillerymen, and they cared about their craft more than, I mean, they were professional soldiers, they were professional NCOs, they were professional paratroopers, but also professional red legs. You know, they cared about what they, they brought to the service and developing soldiers um, to, to follow in their footsteps. And I just, you know, when I think about my timeline of what I've done in the Army, you know, I, I think of it almost in, in equal halves, Special Forces and 82nd Artillery, in reality, I was only in the 82nd Devardi for about three years, but because I was learning so much from these guys, uh, that's what I think of. And I, I, I know that, you know, the young lieutenants I'm sending out to the force are going to find those same NCOs. They're going to make them the officers they are or that they're going to be for the rest of their career. That's that's good to hear because I, uh, you know, if you pay attention to the news, it's negative, negative, negative. Um, and I'm sure there's a ton of things that 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 any big organization, but especially a government one has, can always improve, improve or improve upon and become more efficient at. But it's nice to hear that the, uh, the raw material is still coming in, you know, that the, that the, the individual is still coming in because uh, one of the things I hate more than anything is, is that concept that, that everything is negative all the time. And I just think we as Americans are generally positive people and have a can do attitude. And maybe I'm being, you know, a little bit naive and Pollyannish about that, but I still really, you know, having these conversations that I'm having with you and many others, it still kind of reinvigorates my belief that our country still produces uh, solid people and thinkers and innovators. And that's good to hear from you. That's a that's that's a note of positivity. So, yeah, I, I definitely think I mean, there have been a, I've seen a lot of changes in the army in my, my 23 years. Um, there have been a lot of uh, changes. Obviously, there's a lot of discussion in, I think, the the, the open uh uh, the population about changes in the army and and I think that's healthy first of all we're the we're the republic's army and we need to be answerable to the people of the republic and the people of the republic should determine how they want us to act and what they want us to do on their behalf right we should not be the separate warrior cast separate from them uh, which kind of goes back to like when we were talking about my bitterness how unhealthy that was for me to think in those terms um, we can't think of ourselves as better or worse but we provide an essential function to society just as every other you know composite part that makes up the united states provides an essential function in public and private sector yeah. um but uh you know so the army may look in some ways different from the outside and even from the inside um you know we've gone through the the repeal of don't ask don't tell which i will tell you came and went without a ripple like i don't i don't think it affected the force at all when don't ask don't tell went away it was a non-issue um, we've had the integration of uh, women into combat arms uh, with my branch, Special Forces, being the last one to integrate women, and that's because we have the Q course. But we recently, about two years ago, graduated the first female Green Beret. Um, there have been women who have been ra leading Ranger platoons in combat um, in, in Ranger Regiment, and there are women in other Special Operations units that have been there actually before uh, the full integration of the, the force. Um, and and I'll tell you right now, it, it, it's not about um, men or women. It's not about, it's about having a warrior ethos. And there are young women who want to be infantrymen and they want to be cavalrymen, uh, in a, in, not in the horse context, in the reconnaissance context, yep. we use them now. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to be artillerymen. Um, I have a, a very good friend, uh, her stepdaughter uh, wanted to go to West Point, was born uh, in the United Kingdom. And uh, so she decided she was going to join the army to to uh, get her citizenship. And right now she's a cavalry soldier in the 82nd Airborne, and she's loving it, just you know, just crushing it. Um, so I, I think that you know we still have a lot of young Americans 
who want to serve and they want to serve in different ways. They want to serve. Uh, we have the infantrymen and we have, like, I always tell people, one of the things that fires me up most is when I go onto an army post and I see some young soldier in the back. There are a lot of like really way over the top, you know, like uh, look at me, I'm a tough guy stickers that you see on stuff. But you see some young soldier with a sticker on the back of his or her car and it says Transportation Corps, right? Mm -hmm. right. And I'm like, damn right, man. Be proud of what you do because number one, you're signing up to do something in an organization that can make things kind of difficult and, and you're leaving your home and family to go do this that was asked of you. And number two, there is no part of the army that can fight by itself. We fight as a combined arms team and you provide an essential function and you're proud of being good at it. And that really motivates me. So, so you know, I, I have a lot of young cadets that, I, that I've uh, taught that, you know, they, there are some that want to go be the infantry leaders and there's some that are like, I really want to be a cyber officer. I want to learn how to use this capability to advance America's national security interests, right. and that's exciting. So yeah. I, I think I think we're the you know, it, the 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 there's a, like I said, there's a lot of churn and tumult and a lot of discussion about some of these things that have changed. But I'll tell you right now, the same things that privates are joking about right now while they're bored and stuck on some stupid detail is the right. same things privates were joking about when I came in the army, and then my dad came in the army, <laughs> and when the Korean War was going on. It's the same thing. The Willie and Joe cartoons are timeless for a reason because. There's certain things that are always the way they are. My stepdad doing watch at 2 a.m. Uh, exhausted in 1942 or whatever it was on a you know on a naval base in San Francisco. You know, going through boot. Uh, yeah, he the same thing, same exact thing. No, that's 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 reassuring to hear. It's good to hear. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, I think one of our, I still think one of our strengths, and I've lived in, you just like you. I've lived and traveled in a lot of places. Is that that we are self-reflective and that we are willing to change and and that we are adaptable and let's hope that that for me anyway my my opinion let's hope that never changes because i think you made a key point that uh, i think a lot of times we speak as of the military as if it were separate from civilians and in our like you said to republic's army we make that decision i still think at the end of the day you guys uh, what you've chosen to do the people in your profession are a reflection of us even though even if there, it's been less and less people that have direct connection, and unfortunately, two people who have served. I still think, at the end of the day, it's a reflection of us. So um, that's on that's on the civilian side, on our side, that we have to do <laughs> be more uh, aware and cognizant of the fact that when we vote and we make policy, you know, people on your end carry it out, and it, it, one doesn't work without the other, and one's not separate from the other. So yep. uh, that's a separate that's a separate thing. Um, going forward, plans. What do you what, what's next for you? Well, uh, so I'll, I'll finish my transition with uh, my replacement who's coming in. I'll, uh, I'll continue clearing and, and go on uh, retirement leave. And while I do, I'll start looking for, uh, for what my next chapter is. Uh, I just finished my MBA, so I'm, you know, right. I'm going to go become a, you know, a, a, a corporate shill, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> my, <A> CPA. <laughs> my, my, my middle son just makes fun of me because he's like, you know, you're a soldier. Now you're just going to be a businessman or something like that. Um, That'll be love, interesting for you, man. That's all you've ever done, so it'll be real I, interesting for you. I love when my kids are smart asses to me because I know exactly where they get it. That's what I was um, going to say. <laughs> Come but, by it, honestly. Uh, I, I mean, one of the things, and I'm not knocking this because this is what my dad did when he got out, and it's what a lot of my friends do. I'm not knocking this at all. I'm just, I'm mm -hmm. for me, there's a, a natural trend, I think, for a lot of um, you know retired Army officers and NCOs to get out and then go right into defense contracting. There's a lot yeah. of requirement for additional man and brain power to, to work on some of these problems. Um, I have loved what I've done so much. Uh, this is, like I said, the only thing I've ever wanted to do, and I've loved every day I've worn the uniform and been grateful for the people I've served with, that I'm part of an organization that has a higher, or a, 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 a encompassing sense of purpose. And, you know, just coincidentally, while I was doing it for, for most of the time I was in, it was all you know, directed at something going on overseas. You know, there were yeah. real effects we were trying to drive in addition to just training for readiness. Um, I've loved that so much, I'm not sure I wanna be next to it, but not part of it anymore, mm. um, if that makes sense. I yep. think that might yep. that might be a little rough for me. So uh, I think I'm going in a different direction uh, okay. and, and we'll see what those opportunities are. Still looking for a challenge, still looking for places where I can lead and contribute, um, but um, you know, probably in a different direction. Cool. I hear you, man. Um, yeah, best of luck with that, by the way, because that separation, especially for someone that's been in it from, you know, 18 to adulthood, that's a, that can be a, that can be a challenge. Um, OK, uh, 
any organizations near and dear. And you also, you, you've written, published a few places. Um, if people want to read what you've written or things like that, or f any organization that you want to mention that I can link up to. Uh, well, so I'm a, I'm a visiting fellow at the National Security Institute at George Mason, completely unrelated to my, my uh, professorship there, oh, okay. uh, which is a great organization. They have a blog um, called The Skiff. Uh, where a lot of the, the experts that uh, I'm lucky to be around uh, publish some of their ideas. I've had some things written there. Uh, I've written a couple pieces for War on the Rocks. Yep. Um, the Modern War Institute up at West Point, specifically the Irregular Warfare Initiative, yep. uh, has, has, written, has published some of my stuff in the past. Um, and then uh, um, Real Clear uh, Defense has, has yep. been gracious enough to, to publish some of my things. So when I get bored and when I get fired up about something or angry that I don't think people are looking at something, I'll write something every couple, every couple months or a couple of years. Uh, so it comes up every so often. Um, but that's a, that's you know I always tell my cadets that uh, we are the profession of arms. You know, and just like lawyers and doctors and other professions, there is you know a rigorous certification process. There is a uh, a self-regulating set of rules that that maintain professional standards. And there's the expectation that peers and practitioners of this profession are going to learn from each other and exchange ideas. Uh, and so I think that writing and participating in fora like that uh, are, are essential to, to professional soldiers. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The modern, the Irregular Warfare has a, a podcast I subscribe to as well. They have really interesting guests on there all the time as well. And I think I did read your piece uh, in Real Clear Defense. So I follow along. I, I assume when you're not doing uh, 20 second TikTok videos and uh, Twitter and Instagram and all that stuff. <laughs> I, 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 I am on uh, on Twitter. Uh, okay. I'm not sure how professional my my persona there is. Uh, I seem for some reason I seem to have a following of people who like, uh, you know, really corny dad jokes, uh, <laughs> angry rants and, and, and nationals fandom. Uh, okay. So okay. I don't know. There's a nexus there, I'm sure, right, for people that yeah. live in the greater D.C. area, right? And, so. and, and, and bad memes. That's, yep. that's... So 100 per, probably 100% of my Facebook is, is corny bad memes that I like to post that make me, make me laugh. I, you know, ar arguing to, uh, issues of national security endlessly on threads on Facebook, I find about as useless as, or as useful as staring at a wall and watching paint dry. So um, it's, it's, de it's bad corny memes uh, uh, other than that. So, all right, hey, Mike. You've been way, way, way more than generous with your time. And uh, shout out to Connor Powell for introducing us. And um, I, I really, really enjoyed this, man, uh, this whole conversation. And I'll link up uh, some of your stuff in the show notes so people can get a hold of you. Um, like I said, really great conversation, man. And I really appreciate it. And congratulations as you go forward uh, into, into your second life, man. I do have to tell you this one quick story, though, since you mentioned him. I know yep. before we started recording, before we talked about my connection to uh, uh, the the inadvertent connection to, to Connor's wife, uh, yep. that his his wife's aunt was my translator in Afghanistan. But uh, the story I told you about showing up at VMI kind of completely disconnected, having gone to school overseas. So I showed up at VMI with one name that I knew, and it was mm. Connor Powell. Okay. Um, and the reason is we showed up back from, from Prague. My brothers were going to go to uh, the Catholic middle school, St. Thomas More, uh, in the area. And so my mom was uh, signing up to join the archdiocese so that they could my, my brothers could start going to school there. And uh, she met the woman who worked at the archdiocese office. Uh, and they start talking, and she goes, well, my two sons here. My oldest son's getting ready to start at VMI. She goes, my son's about to start at VMI. And she goes, oh, you tell him, tell your son he, he, to look mine up. His name's Connor Powell. So I didn't know who this guy was. I just know that he was like, there's one name. There's somebody who was supposed to be nice to me, you know. That's it. And That's years it. later, here he is connecting us uh, to do this. That's cool, man. That's really cool. Yeah, I was actually wondering uh, how that happened to VMI, given your story about, you know, going in there with no, uh, no prior relationships. So there we go. That's cool, man. That's really cool. All right, Mike. Again, thanks a lot, man. All the best to you. Um, I look forward to reading whatever's uh, – I've followed you on Twitter, so whatever missives, whenever you decide to get uh, agitated and <laughs> and, uh, and fire off a missive to, that the rest of us need to have, I'll, I'll be sure to, sure to take a look at it, man. So, um, again, all the best, and thanks so much for your time, man. All right. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Yep.